Hello, beloveds. Hello. I'm not sure who is all going to make it tonight, but um, here we are, beloveds. Remember, if you're joining this video on YouTube, go 10 minutes in, 10 minutes in to where the teaching begins because I will start right now at 6.55. We will start at 7.05. Mountain Standard Time. Okay, and Yahweh, please bless us with your presence tonight. Okay. Love you guys. Um, I'm just going to tell a few people here. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, guys. We're gonna go live here. Hi, Romaine. I was just praying for you. That's funny. You popped. You were on my mind um, just a minute ago, dear. I was just gonna message a few people. I. It's hard. I know I was doing so many lives. Hi, Laura. Shalom, shalom, sister. Um, um. Okay. Let's see. Going live. Okay. I'm just kind of trying to message a few people. Hi guys, hello, hello. Laura, I was just praying for you as well. Oh, I well, I was thinking about there, I was feeding my cows and I'm just like, oh, she's so beautiful. <laughs> I'm just so thankful for you guys. Um, and tonight we're gonna continue in the book of Isaiah. And let's see, um, I'm just telling a few people I'm going live. Sometimes that can be, <laughs> oh, sometimes that can be, Hard to get everybody's attention. Hi, Justin. So you and um, Justin, you, hi, Tristan. Hello, your beautiful family. I love those pictures. Um, Justin, I, so again, if you're on, coming on, like we're gonna start at 7.05. So we've got nine minutes to start. I'm just giving a little intro, letting people kind of get on here. But Justin, you need to connect with that brother, Nate. Um, I think he's a really good guy and I think you guys could help each other. Shalom, Connie. Hello, hello, hello. So some of you don't have to, oops. Um, let's see. sorry sorry for that blurry um which chapter we're going to start in chapter four today we're in isaiah chapter four um and then oh goodness um anything you guys have to share hi guys i'm just kind of going through tristan i don't need to message you do i miss tristan i don't need to message um and then we have all you beautiful souls in here yesterday and i haven't been as <laughs> on Facebook as much. I'm still on Facebook, but I don't, um, it's not quite the same. Um, I haven't been as, like yesterday, I completely wasn't on until like all day. I just need to take, hello, Danielle. Hello, sweetie. I'm um, sorry, guys, my hair's bothering me, so I'm putting that, okay. Anybody, does anybody have a praise report? Hello, Faith. Hello, Dale. Hello, guys. How is everybody doing? We got about um, we'll do seven more, I'm sorry, seven more minutes and then we'll start. Does anybody have any praise reports? Does anybody have Shalom Mishpaka? Um, anybody have anything to share? Any prayer requests? We do need to lift up our brother James tonight. So please, if everybody, we could say a prayer. Oh, there he is. I was just going to say, we need to lift up our brother James. Um, praise report. Yay, faithful you share. Hi, Cassandra. I love you, sweetie. Hi, Jody. Shalom. Jody, um, I have not had time to follow up. Let me know how that's going. Um, Yahweh bless you. Um, okay, guys, I'm just going to let people... Oh, whew, I see that I missed a lot of messages. I'm so sorry. Please don't get offended if I miss your message. Because I miss messages because my computer sometimes will be opened when I'm editing. I've been editing this week. And then it'll look like... I saw your message and I didn't. My kiddos really were shocked after reading the word about we. Well, yeah. Yes. Oh, no. Father God, please help Lila's family, uh, Lila's friend's family. Father God, please deliver them. Please help James. Strengthen him. Please make him a mighty man in the face of Satan's attacks. Yahweh, please. Thank you for providing for faith. Please provide for Jody. Lord, please, Yahweh, help your children. Um, hello, Everan. Hi, D. Hi, Anthony. Guys, if I've missed anybody's messages, please forgive me. I've been <laughs> so crazy. Um, um, shalom, shalom, guys. We're going to go through Isaiah tonight, beginning in verse 4. I don't know um, if I got everything here. And you guys, just so you know, you're never bothering me. 
You're never bothering me, message me. And if I accidentally don't get back to you, write back to me. Oh, okay, good. Yep, we're gonna stay with you, we're gonna pray. Danielle, how was your cleaning today? Um, hello guys, I'm gonna just, I'm just messaging a few people while we have a few more minutes, or five more minutes, and then we're gonna go live. Sorry, you get to look at the beautiful long nose while I'm doing that. Um, where is, let's see here. Um, does anybody else have, okay, so, hi Graciela, I was thinking of you just a little bit ago too, because I get down, on my knees and I pray for you guys and then I'm just like yeah they help oh yay oh wow praise Yahweh praise Yahweh praise Yahweh Laura um yay oh wow praise Yahweh praise Yahweh faith hello hun hello everyone shalom 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 um that's you guys our God is so good Honestly, I've missed you guys all too, like without doing the lives, because I was doing the lives, you know, Sunday night, and then we were doing Tuesday, we were doing Sunday Zoom, then we were doing Tuesday, Thursday lives, and then Friday Zoom, and then Saturday morning Zoom, and <laughs> so this week we're just doing this Wednesday live, and Friday night Zoom, and Saturday morning teaching. Okay, remember that. So tonight, Friday night Zoom, Saturday morning on um, uh, Facebook Live, and okay. Four more minutes, kiddos. Four more minutes, and then we're going to begin. Um, okay. Okay. I'm not messaging everybody. I don't know. Who am I missing? Um, I just go through the messages and see what n name was there first. <laughs> but, okay. Okay, guys. He gets all the glory. He show me. Oh, awesome, Faith. You're amazing. He, he works on all of us, doesn't he? We're all works in progress, and that's why we need to be gentle with each other, kind to each other, um, because we all need each other. We, <laughs> Yahweh is going to be correcting us and teaching us, and that doesn't give us the right to judge each other, to be judgmental, to be vindictive. It means, hi, Jesse. Um, it means that we get to help each other. So if you're gossiping about somebody, you're talking about somebody in a way that's negative, we need to stop because that's, I have a praise report. Gil has been filling in text. Ooh, yep. I, wow. Praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh, Cassandra. Honestly, Gil, I keep seeing a vision of his faith all week. And so I've been praying for you guys as well. Um, hi, Thomas. Shalom, brother. And, um, okay, guys, we're going to go three more minutes. Oh, I'm so glad I found you. Praise Yahweh for all this beautiful family. This is a beautiful family. We are one. We are together. Um. I have some beautiful sisters like and brothers on here. We don't agree on everything, but we're very kind and respectful and we're working through things. So two more minutes. And so welcome, Coronado. Um, Yahweh bless you, bless you, bless you. And we just really love each other. Um, the one thing to do is like if when your sing is, like for example, <laughs> um, yesterday with my husband, he had said something kind of, <laughs> maybe not the best tone and boy it hurt my feelings and because we've been going through this pretty hard last week with some things I realized mm, I just right away I had to calm myself down and say like it's not about me just love them just forgive just go on right we're constantly checking our hearts guys um, we're constantly checking our hearts out um hey guys welcome to get accepted for one yes Okay, guys. Hallelujah. Yay, I'm here. Yes. So, me and Leah are officially sisters. So, Leah now is named Smith. I'm teasing. Um, I love that little thing. We're on the Smith. That's so awesome. And she was the most beautiful bride. Leah's little picture. If you want to go over to Leah Nicole Smith's pictures, she was such a cute little bride. Um, yay. Um, yes, and honestly, Cassandra's going to be such a pretty little bride. <laughs> what was that dark pretty curly hair um yeah it'll be cute um we're gonna start here in one more minute guys um still cracking me up i'm sure you touched on it before but jesus said it's not what goes in your body that defiles you what comes out absolutely austin so he's talking about therapy that's in matthew 15 
and Mark 7. It's important to use exegesis and read the whole entire passage. If you read Mark 7 first, what you'll notice is that the Jews came to him and said, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? And Yeshua is like, why do you set aside the commandments of God to hold to your traditions of men? Because it says those in Judaism teach, and they do, that when you come back from the marketplace, you must wash your hands or else the food, food becomes defiled. Now, food is not people. Food is not cyanide. Food is not right food is not pork so the things that are food and so when Yeshua then concludes the matter in Matthew 15 he says like it's not eating with unwashed hands that defiles the food it's what comes out of your heart and so food like that's like never would a person have taught against the Torah they already knew God's laws see there wasn't a, a, a confusion amongst the Hebrew believers of what was food but what there was a confusion of is in Judaism they said you had to eat with washed hands and Jesus is like no they don't Yeshua said my they don't have to that's not what defiles the food that's a man-made rule that was in the Talmud that was in Judaism hope that makes sense Austin it is 705 guys so let's begin now um, and then so what I'm gonna point out those of you who know me know um, exactly, the line of Judah. Those of you who know me know that I can't read all the comments and questions till I give breaks. Let's though begin in prayer. Um, and please, 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 I had to clarify with somebody today. I want you all <laughs> sharing on my posts. I need, I have hundreds of notifications between Facebook and Instagram and what you guys take the lead. You guys, boom, 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 boom. Share your scripture. That's how you get refined. I am like not like I'm nothing without you. See, that's what I've always said. You can't. Okay, I might be the mouth with these big old lips that know how to talk fast, but one of you is the ear, one of you is the eye, one of you is the hand. Do not think I don't need you. But what you also can't think is you don't need me, <laughs> right? We need each other. I'm nothing. I am absolutely nothing. I'm literally here to fulfill the purpose God has given for me. That's why I'll never take money from you. I'm not going to exalt myself above you. But if you ever get a thought from Satan where like where the enemy's trying to divide you from me and I or if I had a thought from Satan where I was trying to divide from you or leave you, that's where we don't want to give into that. You guys are amazing. Like I need you. We have we have little Angela, our little secretary girl, and she keeps track of everything. And we have Danielle who's right there on the spot to give everybody the information. We have we have um we have Cassandra who's right there with, she's been studying that knowledge and memorizing it. Her and Morgan are gonna like put that out there to you. I need that all guys. We are a body and you're all beautiful. And so please don't be afraid. I had, and some people are afraid. They're like, oh, I just don't wanna blow up the thing. I'm like, no, blow it up, blow it up. Because the more people, the more people you, who comment on my reels and the posts, the more it gets out there to more people. I am getting messages daily. I'm not joking, guys. Every single day, somebody's reaching out and saying, wow, all of a sudden, I'm not eating pork. And somebody wrote me last, last Friday, this is thanks to you, I'm no longer like, <laughs> thanks to you, I can't eat pork anymore. Thanks to you, I can't, I I'm keeping the Sabbath. There's two different people last Friday. Guys, keep it up. Keep it up there. Prayer request. I burn my arm. <gasps> Yavi, please heal. Cassandra, please release healing into that burn. Take out the heat. Take out the... The, don't let there be any infection. Please heal her. Please, of course, teach her if there's anything. Please help. Please help. Please help in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Sometimes, if, sweetie, if you're playing with something too hot, I don't know. Okay. But guys, please share on the post. Please like comment. Please do all that. Um, um, exactly, Jesse. Praise Jave. Yay, Nikki. Okay. Now, guys, I brought down this because I saw a vision a little bit ago. You know how it goes. There's a lot of people. <laughs> so the more people that are coming to Yahweh, the more they're sharing and the more there's attack and the more, the more there's spiritual attack. And uh, I had seen a vision earlier. I was like, Lord, what's going on? And he showed me Satan and Satan looked right at me and flicked his serpent tongue. And I was like, well, then we're going full bore. <laughs> like, bring it. Because my God, my God's bigger than you. Like, you're not going to stop this. And so, Father Elohim, Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we lift up your body. We lift up your body before you. And I ask for a hedge of protection that you don't lose one of your sheep, that none of us exalt ourselves, that none of us are arrogant, and none of us get condemned, Father, that we would faithfully and and humbly walk the role together hand in hand that you have given to us that father we would glorify your name together and every single one of us would live only for your glory your glory your glory your name your honor your power may we never take money from anybody we, may we never falsely misuse your gifts that you've given us and father god would you make us one in you keep us one in you but in the areas where we're not yet make us one in you and yavi elohim would you please come and teach tonight keep the internet connections working for everybody help the children hear your 
Hear your words so they can be strengthened to go out there. Father God, please deliver us from the mighty one and anywhere we're in error. Please teach us and correct us. And where we're right, strengthen us and shore us up. May we be mighty soldiers for you, for your glory, for your name. We bless your name. We praise your name. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, guys. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Thomas, I saw that on your post. That it's something you had posted on a comment. That's so beautiful. Okay, ready, guys? before our God. He's good. Okay, guys. Now, guys, what we're going to do is I want to, first of all, like I had men, uh, mentioned on the thing, the real, the, the title. Sorry, one second. Because who else is like me? You can't think without a pen in your hand. It's like the brain goes, hi, Faith. Hello, hello. Um, now, I have to have a pen in my hand to think. And if I don't, I feel like naked. Calendar, calendar, calendar. We're going to do like a little five, 10 minute little briefing on the calendar here. Now, there's a big argument if the 11th, the night of the 11th was the new moon of the new year. <sighs> Differing reports from everybody. But what I do when there's controversy, I hit my knees and I say, Father, speak to me. Father, show me what you need me to know. Because Devorah is saying there's not very much. Even on renewedmoon.com, they're saying they only found four little fields. One of them was a genetic, genetically mod, modified field. Some of them were wild. And it was very, very little portions. And so somebody's trying to argue. Somebody was arguing with me today saying, oh, the first fruits, she, she's a, I'm, I grew up in a farming family that did wheat and stuff. And so I get it too. And, and so I get that. But she was saying the first fruits, you only have a little bit. Like, of the harvest. I'm like, right. But everybody in the land of Israel for the Feast of First Fruits would have to bring the first fruits of the harvest, right? So if you only have four little patches in the entire land of Israel, so only four people could bring their harvest while the rest of us just sat there waiting? I don't think so. I don't think so. And when you're, and, and I do farm, like my family were, they did thousands of acres of wheat up in Montana. Thousands, thousands, thousands of acres of wheat. The wheat starts ripening and there is a smaller percentage at the first fruit. So there's just a few of them. And that is what we were to take to Yahweh before we can eat. When you look, when I kneeled down, when I sat there and I said, Yahweh, just teach me. I'm open to you. You show me. He said, Melissa, April 8th is a sign to the world. And that is the new year. Not that April 8th is the new year, but within the few days of April 8th. He said, <clears throat> on, <clears throat> on April 8th, he goes, that solar eclipse is a sign. That's right about the beginning. That's the end of this year and the beginning of a new year. He goes, that's a sign. I was like, okay. I was just walking, you know, how he talks in my ear. And then he said, he said, Melissa, what you, everybody has to be able to bring the first of their first fruits to the Feast of Hagbikarim, right? Everybody has to bring the first of their Abib barley harvest, not just one or two people. It wasn't just, it doesn't say that. It says every single person was to go to the temple and bring it. He goes, there's like, literally, they've barely found any. And I'm like, you're right, Lord. And he said, um, oh, what was the other thing he told me? Oh, and then I asked for a number of signs. So I was outside and I asked for very difficult signs. I said, okay, Lord, I believe you're telling me that this is the 13th month. If that's the case, I asked for a sign. Boom, I got it. I'm like, okay. And then I said, now I need one more sign, Father. If this is the 13th month, <laughs> And like eight, around April 8th, we'll have the beginning of the year. Ask for the, And it was a difficult sign, like difficult. And I almost thought I didn't get it, and I got it. I turned around, and there it was. And so I firmly believe what the Father has shown me, based on every report I've seen, that this new moon that we just saw on the 11th is the beginning of the 13th month. Now let's clarify what is happening, because some of you are like, I don't know, a 13th month, new year, Abib, well, what's it mean? <laughs> okay. In the ancient Hebrew, okay, do you remember in Exodus, it says in Abib, so like Exodus 12, Exodus 13, um, it talks about the month of Abib, A-B-I-B, -B, but in Hebrew, it's not that, remember? <laughs> it's Aleph, Vet, Vet. Now, that word is, literally means a specific stage of barley ripeness. Let's go back to the simplification of the, how, God, how simple God is. When he labeled the days of the week, he called them Yom Rishon. Day first, <laughs> Yom Shini, 
Day second, Yom Shlishi. Day third, Yom Rivi. Day fourth, Yom Chamishi. Day five, Yom Shishi. Day sixth, ordinal numbers, and then Yom Shabbat. They stop. <laughs> God doesn't even make us guess. He is so interested in us understanding His truth. Okay, now. Um, that's a stimming thing with being on the spectrum. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Now, sorry, I got distracted by a comment. <laughs> now, with a beeb, that word means a specific stage of barley ripeness, when they could start harvesting it and begin eating some of the very first of the produce. It's a green stage of barley ripeness. So Yahweh literally told, told them, when you see Aviv, <laughs> you know it's the beginning of the year. That's why he's, he's like so clear. He's like, when you see the visible new moon sighting, then you know it's a new month. Like you don't have to work on conjunctions and do some weird calculations. You could be a shepherd in the field and be like, oh, there's the new moon sighting, right? And then you're, you understand. And so with the new year, when we see enough barley in the stage of Abib that the community of Israel could bring an offering of the first of their harvest, then we know it's... It, then we know it's the beginning of the year, the next new moon sighting. So, does that make sense? What I'm struggling with is why they would look for the new moon then to see if there's enough. Oh, okay, yes. So, Cassandra, you're right. That's a kind of a weird thing. So, Devorah, I think she wanted to make sure because since there was was some controversy, Devorah, um, so she used to be, I guess, used to be married to Nehemia Gordon. And I remember that because, uh, anyway, so that's a whole different situation. But, and a nice, the high. Caiaphas, the high priest, prophesied over Yeshua. So wisdom is where wisdom is found. Doesn't, you know, some people have a lot of wisdom, even if they've done, had some problems in life. So some people are trying to knock her for that. You know, just, re just forgive and pray for her. Now, the 10 days, what Deborah Gordon is doing is just to make sure that they didn't miss any, but she's pretty sure she didn't. Now, Hebrew and Israel, he's saying that you could just count the wild barley, but there still wasn't much. They literally found one patch or two patches, like the total of four patches in the entire nation. <laughs> like that doesn't make it possible. And so I'm not gonna wait, Cassandra, I sat and prayed. So what I do is when there's a question, I have learned, and I want you guys to learn this, to stop and seek the Father. All I did was there was different answers going around and I said, Yahweh, speak to me. I'm like, just you show me. And that's when he spoke those things to me. And then I asked for two signs to confirm it and both signs, were not easy signs. I didn't ask for something like, oh, let me see the moon in the sky. You know what I mean? I was like, boom. And he gave me the signs. And so then when he has confirmed his word and he spoke in my ear, then I go forward in that with faith, knowing that, okay, he knows. And so um, I'm a town girl. What are my first words? Well, Joe, okay, so we can't do the Feast of First Fruits in America. I know we've talked about that so many times and we probably miss it. Um, we can't really do the Feast of First Fruits in America because we were to, we have to take your first fruits to the temple. We don't have the temple yet, so we're still in a state of mourning. Now, on that day, it's not a rest Sabbath. Remember, we've talked about that. Please go watch the feast videos that I've done. Um, um, there's a... Uh, we, we just, we mourn and we read about it and we study it, but it's not really a, it's not really a Sabbath day. It's not like a stop Sabbath day. Um, and so I hope that makes sense. Are there any more questions, please? Like right now, I'm going to bring this closer so I can see better. Why do they make this print so small? They should make it bigger for us old people. Are there any questions about that explanation of the bee barley? Please feel free to question hard. I'm not, you know, you can question me. Your questions will not offend me. I'm not going to get angry. I think some people misunderstand. Oh, hi, Sarah. Hi, sweetie. I didn't see you on. Um, some people misunderstand when on my videos, when I mess, when I respond, because I don't think of the fluff. I don't think of putting a smiley face here, a heart there. I don't think of that stuff. I'm just answering very just because um, I'm like that. But I don't, I'm not offended when you ask your questions. I love it. I'm not offended. You guys are not taking up my time. Sometimes I physically don't have enough hours in the day to get to the messages with them, but I will get to them. And if it's urgent, <laughs> just say, how, you know, like say, I really need to know this and whatever. Um, are there any questions on why we are counting this the 13th month? I'm not going to wait for the 10th day, as Devorah said, because there was just, I, I agree, Cassandra. I agree, because it, it, it just, <laughs> I know she was doing it to cover because so many people were coming against her, I believe. So she's like, okay, we're going to check again in 10 days just to make sure. But I don't think so. It looks like it's the next month. Um, 
there's only four fields, four fields. So in 10 days, like that's when we would take the lamb into our home. If this, if this was the first month, it's just, boy, if you're a farmer, like I am, like 10 days isn't enough time to get the entire nation of Israel to have some of their first fruits ready. So any questions, any questions, any questions, or are we good to go? Thumbs up if we're good to go into Isaiah. Okay. We got some thumb, one thumb, a couple thumbs. Okay. Let's go. And miss, um, okay. So Isaiah four, this is, remember the book of Isaiah, like we talked about is very pertinent to then and now. It was, you know, they were writing to the uh, house of Judah, but he's also writing to us now. This is a very big prophetic book. Okay, okay. Yeah, me teach us, please. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Okay. <laughs> Things are going to get tough. Things are going to get really tough. If you remember back to Isaiah chapter 2, what did it say? Hi, Angela. Hi, Isabel. What did it say was going to go forth from Zion when Yeshua returns during the, these last days? In the latter days, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? The law will go forth from Zion. What's, right? So when Yeshua comes, oh, we're in, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 4. So we read about chapter 3 where the women were getting rebuked for being kind of, um, haughty and arrogant, um, kind of like everybody in America, like how they're being immodest and whatnot. Um, says so they're walking and mincing and they're just being all arrogant and like vain. And Yahweh's like going to bring that down, right? He's going to humble them. And then we talked about Isaiah chapter two, the future house of God. And we talked about this call to repentance from chapter in chapter one. Why I did that backwards, I don't know. But we're in Isaiah chapter four now. And it says, in that day, seven women. Seven is the number of perfect or completion. So it's like, these women are gonna take hold of one man saying, we will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. So there's going to be such a loss of life, such destruction that they're not gonna have enough men to marry. It talks about in the book of Isaiah coming up, it says he's going to make man more rare than the gold of Ophir during this tribulation. There's indication that two thirds of the world's population is going to die during the tribulation. If you look at the book of Zechariah and elsewhere. So this is a prophetic picture saying, hey, please take away our reproach. It's, it's just a, a picture, an analogy of the tough times coming, right? And as a woman, typically it's harder for us to make a living. Now, some people do fantastic because Sandra seems to be extremely blessed and talented in her business. And many women are, I, I, you know, but a lot of women, it's easier, it's easier in this world for a man. And it just is for most situations. And so that's why they're looking to this man to take away the approach. Verse two, this is important. In that day, the branch of Yahweh shall be beautiful and glorious. That's the word samach in Hebrew. Who is the branch of Yahweh? And that's also in the book of Zechariah. Who is the branch? Who is the branch? In that day, the branch of Yahweh shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. So here the branch is a prophetic, symbolic picture of Yeshua. Now, for those people who are literal, <laughs> Yeshua does not come back as a tree branch. <laughs> he's not going to look like a tree branch. Please remember, he's not going to look like a tree branch. It's symbolic. And if you look in that word there, I just wanted to make sure. I've, I've read this... Um, yeah, Tzemach. I was like, I hope I said the word right. Um, if you look, if you click on that word, it's also going to show you, it's a sprout, a growth, a branch, a growing, a shoot. It's also found in, I want to find the exact verse for you. So it's in, well, Isaiah 61, 11 as well. Um, the one I was really trying to get for you was Zechariah 3, 8 and Zechariah 6, 12. Okay, so you can make a side note of those because when you go to Zechariah 612, here's what it says. Then speak to him saying, thus says Yahweh Sevaot saying, behold the man whose name is the branch. D d okay, again, literal people, like, do we really think we're gonna call Yeshua Tzemach when he comes back? Are we gonna say, hey, it's Tzemach, hey, it's Tzemach, hey, the branch. No, it's a picture because it already told us his name when he returns as Yahweh sits Kenu, Yahweh our righteousness. Um, From his place he shall branch out and he shall build the temple of Yahweh. Okay, so, backing up to Zechariah 3 8 it says here O Joshua the high priest you and your companions who sit before you for there a wondrous sign for behold I am bringing forth my servant the branch okay so this is a prophetic picture of Yeshua the branch um, and if you think about a tree 
if you think about a tree, the branches are, you know, coming off of it, um, they provide shade, they provide foliage, they provide, okay, the word branch is also capitalized. Yes, you got it, you got it. So, they, because, right, because the prophet, the people who understand prophecy did see that this was a prophecy of Messiah, the branch. I do want to point out, because a lot of people will draw um, menorahs and they'll say, well, Yeshua is the center, or they'll draw a tree of Israel and say, Yeshua is the center. And he is, but he's also a branch. <laughs> he's also called the branch, not the root, not the main stem, but a branch, a shooting out, an offspring, something that blooms, something that, you know, provides shade and, and has the foliage. Okay. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent, appealing. So Yahweh is going to physically restore the earth, but what could that fruit also be indicating? What could it apply to? Um, what could that fruit apply to? Because the fruit of the earth shall be excellent, appealing, because it tells us, right, that there will be no more sinners amongst the children of Israel. So if you have the fruit of the spirit, that's contrary to sin, correct? And so the fruit that will be in the earth will be extremely pleasant. And this is where I would cue Song of Songs if you hadn't read the whole Bible. Once you got to just know that whole Bible because the whole Bible goes together. So the fruit that we produce, the fruit of righteousness, will be spreading across the world. We will be humble, pure, loving, kind, obedient, not proud. It's going to be so beautiful. And our fruit from our branch is going to be beautiful. So yes, yes, the food, the earth will be restored. We're going to have a restoration and a cleansing period. And there won't be any GMOs. There won't be any pesticides, herbicides. We're going to have wonderful fruit in the earth. But this fruit is our fruit to Yahweh. Oh, I love this. And it shall come to pass that he who is left, ooh, 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 he who is left in Zion. Guys, that means a lot aren't left there. <laughs> that means a lot died. And remains in Yerushalayim will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Yerushalayim, because remember, where is the final battle? All around Jerusalem. All nations will surround Jerusalem and Yahweh will come there for, to the Mount of Olives to fight the last battle of Armageddon and save his people. Listen, all who remain in Sion will be called holy. That word holy is kadosh or kodesh and it means set apart, different from. Wow, we're not going to be the wretched, we're not going to be stuck in our sin. God's going to leave in, a, um, in their midst a meek and humble people. That's what it says which prophet is that? Maybe Haggai? I don't remember. But after this tribulation, he's going to leave in the midst a humble, pure, fruitful people. Think of ourselves as fruity. Sometimes, I know this is silly, but draw yourself with like a fruit hat. <laughs> Think of yourself as being, I do a lot of like physical things with myself. Um, like to help me, like I want to be fruitful. I want to be fruitful in my thoughts, in my actions, in my heart. I want to be so pure. I want to hold no grudge against anybody. I don't want to take offense. I don't want to think my own thoughts. I just want to be fruitful. So I draw a lot of fruit <laughs> and I eat a lot of fruit. And when I'm eating a lot of fruit, I mean, I eat a ton of fruit, a ton of fruit. I'm like, I just want to be fruitful. I want to have the fruit of the spirit. I want to have nothing yucky. Okay. Listen to verse four, highlight this, highlight this, highlight this. This is the most beautiful verse. When the Adonai has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, whoop, what's the purpose of the tribulation? Why would Yahweh let us go through it? This right here. Raise your hand if you're a child, if you're a daughter of Zion, and every single one of you, men included, better have your hand raised. You better have your hand raised. There's no Gentile gate going in. You are grafted in, according to Romans, if you are an actual Gentile. You can see that in Caleb and Ruth and Nathan the prophet. And guess what? Ezekiel 47 says the same thing in the last three verses. I don't know why I said it like that. Guess what? <laughs> the tribulation is to wash us. So get that scrubbing soap out. And it's what? By what? By the spirit of judgment. He's going to judge our wicked actions. So if any of you have weird heart issues, let's get them out now. The scrubbings, like right now, the Holy Spirit still has a little bit of tenderness in him. That fire is going to come. So if we already have the yucky out, we'll be able to endure it, right? Right? So he's coming to judge us by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. That is the baptism of fire. And all of you, and all of you, hi, hi, Nelly, I didn't see you. All of you are daughters of Zion. All of us are daughters of Zion, men, women. We are going to 
be washed from our filth. Praise God, praise God, praise God, because I'm a horrible, wretched soul. We're going to be purged from blood. That means bloodshed, slander, meanness, anger, unforgiveness. That's bloodshed. If you have something against somebody, you better forgive. If you're having a bitter thought in your heart to somebody, you better forgive. You better get it out because that's bloodshed. You have no right after what you've been through. If somebody's struggling and stumbling and they treated you wrong, then you get on your knees and you pray for the person. You wash their feet. You love them. You love them. Hi, Anna. Hi, guys. Hi, Randy. Randy. Okay, so we will be... The tribulation is to wash us from the guilt of bloodshed, to wash us from our filth by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Now, personally, I can understand that doesn't sound fun, but I want the end result. That's why I don't stop God when he's working on me. That's why I don't go to doctors. That's why I don't take his hand out of the way. I want the end result of his loving hand crushing the wickedness from me, right? Okay, so then Yahweh will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies. That's the word church. That's a group. It means a group of people. A cloud and smoke by day. Oh, like the Exodus. They were covered by a cloud during the day. And the shining of a flaming fire by night. Just like the story of the Exodus above the tabernacle. For over all the glory, there will be a covering. I want to, I think this is the word kanaf. I want to make sure here. Um, I didn't read it in Hebrew before we started tonight. Okay, that's the word. Oh, that's the word hupa. Oh, that's amazing. So that's a defense. Over all the glory, there will be a canopy. So many people, when they get married, when they're biblical, they get married under a hupa. It's called a hupa. And it's this umbrella, it's symbolic of umbrella, umbrella of covering. So when they do the ketubah, which is the marriage ceremony, they put this hupa over them and they exchange their vows under a hupa, which is kind of just symbolic of this protective covering. Beautiful. And there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime from the heat for a place of refuge and for a shelter from storm and rain. And what does it say in Zechariah 14? All who are left of the nations must come up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem or they will not get rain. Guys, you must know the whole Bible. Do you see how you have to put this all together? Okay, stop, pause. Any questions about chapter four? Any added comments? Anything you want to say? Now, I do think... Some of you, if you have something to say personally and it's relevant, I think you can click on that little thing, the invite thing, and then I can add you, or add you to the call if you want, have something that is pressing on your heart because I think it is good for everybody to say what they see. Anybody have any questions or anything or just keep going? Ready to keep going? Okay. Let me give a few seconds here. Okay, praise Yavi. Okay. Yeah, I know. I love the book of Isaiah. If you, I, you can ask anybody who knows me. My favorite book of the Bible is Isaiah and then Genesis. If you gave me one book, give me Isaiah, <laughs> give me Genesis, and then give me John, and then give me Ezekiel, and then give me Zechariah. I mean, man, I just love the word of God. <laughs> I love Oh, thank you guys. Um, and you know, I don't take money. We've been teaching Torah for 22 years. We do not start nor named organizations. We're not about that. Please feel free to reach out. Um, and I do want to do more teachings next week. This week, I just, y'all know. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I had like five phone calls today. Back to back to back to back to back to back to back. It took me three hours just to get those phone calls in. And I had to short, I had to keep everybody short. So, and I was stuck in town doing that. So I, I do try to give you as much as I can. It's easier if you just message me, just like message me rather than schedule a call. Cause I don't, then I have to drive to town usually and do all that, but it's okay. Um, I know, I know. I just don't know. I just like, those are my favorite books. Okay. Chapter five. Now let me sing to my well-beloved, a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. Ooh, that's you. That's me. And if you've ever seen a vineyard or been, had a vineyard, we prune it. Okay. How do you forgive someone? Okay, wait. Um, 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 you can forgive that person. So you just have to remember what I tell myself is, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? So the person can like, I did not do such a good job yesterday with my husband. He spoke pretty nasty to me and I, I got angry. Not good. Um, and there's been some things going on which precipitated or precedented that, but I was like, you can't do that to me. I'm just trying to love you right now. And I was, I was literally trying to be considerate. And then, so I just had to get a hold of myself and be like, 
who are you who are you who are you and then i just had to be like this is ridiculous this person's struggling like they need god and so when you look at somebody who's being mean to you or nasty to you you have to say this person needs yahweh like they don't understand they're trapped by satan right now in this emotion um so if somebody's stuck in arrogance unforgiveness nastiness meanness cattiness whatever it is you need to put yourself in that person's shoe and say who am i who am i and i honestly Yahweh has really worked on me and and I really have always had a pretty pure heart. My situation is there's a few times when I'm really tired that I'm not myself and I'll say things that are just like negative and I just have to rebuke myself and and that's you know I have to keep so it's not like you're just perfect <laughs> like we still have to work on ourselves and mine's when I'm exhausted like when I'm exhausted and then I'm like oh stop stop so I don't want to pretend People sometimes give false hope because they tell you you're perfect. No, I do have a pretty pure heart. I do love and forgive very easily. At the same point, I mess up all the time. I'm like, I have to be corrected. We're teaching. We have to kind of overcome our flesh constantly. So you just work on it. You pray and you keep going. Um, yeah. Jody, you're right. Um, I love Jeremiah too, Sarah. That's good. Okay. Uh, now again, let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes. This is a parallel, uh, parable. But it brought forth wild grapes, like uncultivated bad grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah... Remember, this is speaking to the southern kingdom of Israel, not the northern kingdom, just Jews. Judge, please, between me and my vineyard, Yahweh and his vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please tell me, you, okay, I'm sorry, please tell me, I'm sorry, please tell me, to, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. So Yahweh is sitting here like, I took this, I dug out special place for this vine. It was supposed to bring forth good grapes. This is Israel, Judah. And it brought forth wild grapes. So you know what? I'm taking down that protective hedge. I'm taking down that wall, and I'm going to let it be burned. This is the spirit of burning again. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they will rain no rain on it. So he's sending judgment of, of plagues of no rain. So there's going to be a drought. He's, there's going to be briars and thorns. For the vineyard of Yahweh Sivaoth is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, doing what is right, being merciful, kind, and loving. But behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So people, they were oppressing people. The poor are oppressed constantly. Some of you are in situations where you have been oppressed by a spouse, by a church you were in, by family, by other people. And so, you, you know, when you're crying out for justice, you have he's like, wow, what is going on? So I'm going to take down the hedge of protection and I'm going to burn it. Woe to those who join house to house, they add field to field, till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. In my hearing, Yahweh Sevaot said, Truly, many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitants. See, he's prophesying judgment. For ten acres of vineyards shall yield one bath. That's like bad, right? So if you have ten acres cultivated of vineyards and you're only going to get one bath, that's not good. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink. The drunkards of Ephraim, but this is the drunkards of Judah. And this is spiritual drunkardness as well. So when people get up and they do the religious traditions versus the commandments of God, when they do their, they're intoxicating themselves, they're drinking, they're violent, they're, they're thinking impurely. And, and, and when people are only, when they get up and all they think about is how to make more money and how to do this, and how, they're, they're off track. Who continue until night till wine inflames them. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and flute, the wine are in her, their feasts. And wine are in their feasts. But they do not regard the work of Yahweh. So they're having these joyous celebrations, but they're not even thinking about the works of Yahweh. Sounds like a lot of people, right? They're just pushing his hand out of the way. Nor consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. So in the book of Hosea, remember we read the book of Hosea. It said the ten northern tribes will be scattered by Tiglath-Pileser and not be his people anymore. 
It says one of the judgments that came upon them in Hosea 9 verse 3 is that they were going to go to the nations and return and eat unclean things. They have no knowledge. They're being destroyed and consumed. They're being sent into captivity of sin. See, because we're not captives of righteousness when we are, when we obey the law of God. We're a slave of righteousness, but it's not a bad thing. When we disobey the commandments of God, we're a slave of unrighteousness, and that is a bad thing when you're a slave of sin. And so that's a lack of knowledge that leads us there. We have the wrong knowledge. Of, we don't understand what God has been, is trying to show us and speak to us in his truth. And they don't even regard his work, nor consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. And that is coming to the world. It happened to Judah, and it's coming again. Therefore, Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Sheol is kind of like the resting place of the wicked. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down, each man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. Let's just humble ourselves before God has to humble us, because who are we? But Yahweh Sevaot shall be exalted in judgment, and Elohim who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. See, Father is going to make a distinction. And he has been making a distinction with you guys. He's making a distinction between himself who is holy and those who are righteous, or I mean unrighteous and wicked and arrogant. When we were just all in Christian religious practices, notice how arrogant we were. When we come to Torah, we become humble. We become humble and we're like, who are we? I can't take offense. I can't have unforgiveness. Who am I? And so he is making, he in our lives, you know, mine for 20 some years, who knows how long yours is. He has been standing here making a difference. So you see, he alone is God. He alone is God. He alone is Yahweh. He is establishing himself as righteous and holy. Okay. Verse 17. Then the lambs shall feed in their pasture and in the waste places of the fat ones, strangers shall eat then. So after these things, okay, after the desolation comes. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as with a cart rope. And there are some people that just, you, you could free them a million times from sin and they're going to go right back and hook on another cart of sin. That's what this is talking about. Like, man, like Yahweh will be helping them and they just go right back to sin. That say, let him make speed. Listen to this. this is, let me read verse 18 again. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart. That say, these same people say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. That is their arrogant hearts. You ever hear people say, go ahead and bring on the judgment because we're going to be raptured out of here. That is the arrogant heart. Let, yes, of course, let them. They think themselves to be approved. There's like, yes, let him hasten and speed his work. Come on, we'll see it. Because he's going to make, they were confident in their own righteousness, in their own goodness. But Yahweh is going to establish that only he is righteous. He is going to humble them. So those words that they speak, like I hear it all the time. There was a song that used to say, come get me, I'm ready. And I'm like, who would say such a preposterous thing? Even Paul says, I don't count myself approved. Don't hope. It says, woe to those who desire the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord shall be bad, not good. It's going to be hard. The dog does back up. Yeah, exactly. Okay, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. That's your motto. That's your motto for what you're dealing with when you're sharing with these people in the Christian faith. They call good evil and evil good. They literally say, people literally say that following the Torah of God is evil. What? And then they say that if you break the laws of God, it's good. Whereas Yahweh says, no, that's evil. So woe to those who call evil good. They're saying that evil things like the breaking of the Torah is good. And they're saying that good, that following the Torah is evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. They just are so messed up. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. I bet a lot of you have had a lot of conversations recently with people who think they're wise in their own eyes, twisting Paul's words to their own destruction and prudent in their own sight. 
Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. Who, okay, right? They're drinking wine. They're toxic. Like when you go into church, there's it's all filled with vomit and, and intoxication. There's no truth. It's mixing this, mixing this. It's an elixir of lies and deception. Judaism is the same thing. Who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. You ever paid a pastor and then he won't tell you the truth? Oh, yeah, believe me, when you pay your money to those pastors, they tickle your ears. You, you can go to heaven all day long if you pay them, right? You bribed them. You bribed them, and they'll just tickle your ears and tell you you're such a good person. They won't help you overcome your sin anymore. You know why? Because you might leave. Just bribe them. Just bribe them with that money. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble, okay, and then they'll take away justice from the righteous. Like all of you who have left the church system, they're coming after you, correct? They're judging you. They're condemning you. They're telling you that you're wicked and, they're, and you're the one who's actually being righteous by calling out the injustice and the wickedness of the system. Yet they're coming after you and saying that you're wicked so that they are turning away justice from you, right? Okay. Therefore, as the, fire, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have... Be, listen! I'm going to read that again. So their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of Yahweh Sebaot. Oh, they weren't punished for obeying the law? They weren't punished for obeying the law. They were rejected and punished because they rejected the law of Yahweh. They're going to be judged because they rejected the law of Yahweh Sevaot. This is both it happened and it's a prophecy of what's coming. And they despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. And you all know what that's like because you are all out there sharing, 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 sharing. And they're rejecting the word of Yahweh. It's not you they're fighting, kiddos. It is not you they're fighting. They are fighting your Elohim, the mighty one who is in you and standing right by your shoulder and with you. They're fighting him. Therefore, the anger of Yahweh is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them, and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. Tribulation is going to come against the wicked. If they do not accept the word of God, the law of God, they're going to get worse judgment. Let us thank God we are repenting. Oh, I'll be praying for you, Kathy. Um, will we? Okay. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He will lift up a banner to the nations from afar, and he will whistle to them from the end of the earth. Surely they will come with speed swiftly. No one will be weary or stumble among them. So this is the wicked that he's calling to judge his people. No one will slumber or sleep, nor with, will the belt of their loins be loosed, nor the strap of their sandals be broken, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent. Their horses' hooves will seem like flint and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar and lay hold of the prey. They will carry it away safely and no one will deliver. In that day, they will roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sorrow and the light is darkened by the clouds. So that is a very... Um, poetic chapter of what's coming for this end time tribulation. It's also what happened to Judah when Judah was destroyed by Babylon, but it's an end time prophetic picture. Um, okay, awesome. Any questions at this point? Um, exactly, Carissa. They're going to be judged. You just keep sharing the truth, guys. You keep sharing the truth. You keep sharing. We love each other. Let's stay humble before God. Know that Father, hi, Jess. We need corrected by Yahweh. We need to be learned, taught by Yahweh. Let's be humble, keeping his word. We don't want to reject the word of Yahweh and get those extra punishments. Now, it does say judgment's coming. Like the whole world is going to be judged, the righteous and the wicked together. But we understand, hi, sweetie, hi, Dorothy. Um, what we do understand is that um, he will be a covering to us. He'll be protect, And we're going to give our lives. Some of us are going to give our lives for him. At the same point, there's a, there's a peace when you know you're obeying Yahweh. Okay, Isaiah 6. I love this chapter. I love this chapter. I love this chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, that was a, one of the kings of Judah, I saw Yahweh sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So remember the book of Hebrews, we just went through that recently. The heavenly temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to, a, to another and said, 
Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh Sebaot. The whole earth is full of his glory. What does that mean? Holy, holy, holy. Yahweh is holy. He's kadosh. He is different from what you see the default kingdom on the world. Yahweh is not arrogant. Yahweh is not proud. Yahweh is not unrighteous. Yahweh is not mean. Yahweh is not jealous. Or, well, he's jealous, but not in the bad way. Yahweh is righteous. He, the very essence of his law is the essence of him. The commandments of God are the essence of who his nature is. He's different. The reason he had to tell us what the law was is because you have the human default system controlled by Satan, and then you have Yahweh. He's different from holy. The word holy is kadosh, set apart, different from. He is over here in his righteousness and glory, and Satan's over here, and we have to look, we have to join to Yahweh. We must be holy because Yahweh is holy. His whole, the whole earth is filled with his glory, the kavod of Yahweh. So when he returns, and right now, we don't, we see the glory of Yahweh, but we don't. Satan has dominion over the earth right now. When he returns, we're going to see his glory fill the earth. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, <laughs> so he started to get scared. Isaiah gets scared. He goes, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And what does that mean? How readily do you voice your concerns about another? And I have to, con I put myself in here. Don't, I'm not just preaching here. We always have to look at ourselves. Lashon hara in Hebrew is one of the worst sins you can do. And many people with skin problems are guilty of it. That's just one of those things that's shown through Miriam. There's forgiveness, we need to re but we need to repent and come back to Yahweh. We must make sure our lips glorify God. And when we talk about each other, if we mention each other, it needs to be done kindly, justly, and righteously because they are a child of God. They are the image of God. They are the remembrance of God. And we must not say things to each other about it. Um, I usually am really good about not talking about other people until I'm really tired. Sometimes and things will slip out and then I find myself, because I'm not trying to talk bad about them, and I'll be faltering or I, myself, still, <laughs> this is one of the biggest things we all have to work on, I should say. I have to really watch this when I'm tired because I'll say things I don't mean to say that I'm not even thinking that's not in my heart that I'm just tired and rambly but that's still there's still accountability for it we must make sure like the Bible says in many words so the people who talk on the phone a lot if you're having conversations and stuff a lot remember it says many words are not without sin in the book of Proverbs and so what we learn is like let's just talk about the Bible <laughs> Let's get together and talk about Yahweh, what he's teaching us. Let's try to do what is good and holy and just, okay? Um, okay, so Austin, we'll get to there. Let's, let's do it at the end of the chapter here. We'll get to uh, Galatians. Plus, I make, um, actually, could somebody link the Galatians podcast? Um, I don't know if you can. If you can't, please don't worry about it. I'll get it when it's done. Austin, would you please message me? Um, message me, send me a private message. And then I can send you the podcast because the book of Galatians only says we're not saved by obeying the law, right? But it doesn't say not to obey it. It says that we can't count. We, that's not enough to save us, okay? Um, yeah, Tristan. Yeah, exactly. And then we just catch ourselves. And so we need to stay diligent over our minds. So here's Isaiah recognizing that. This is Isaiah, a prophet of God, a very holy person. And he realizes his wickedness in his mouth. And I haven't met anybody who is good with their mouth. I mean, I would say my husband is really good most of the times, but every once in a while I see him falter. So our lips, I think most people's lips are their biggest problem. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you for sharing that. And it's, it's important to be careful how we speak because we are un we have unclean lips. Okay. Okay. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, Yahweh Seva Old. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, <laughs> live coal, hot, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. Now, this is all a, a vision, so it's not going to hurt. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. I have been led here so many times, years ago, when I would say something accidentally, like, Oh, I didn't mean it like that. And I would, Yahweh would open me here. Oh, it is such a refreshing feeling to know he forgives you. But it is something we all have to really work on. Meter our words, meter our talk. I think girls get in trouble more than men because girls talk about things. They just talk about life. Man, that's just, we need to like 
just we just need to be studying, stay busy with our stuff, not just be sitting there chit chatting on the phone. Okay. Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of Yahweh saying, Adonai, actually, this is Adonai there, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Us. That's Yahweh the Father and Yeshua HaMashiach. Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then I said, how, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. Yahweh has removed men far away. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth, a tenth shall be in it and will return. And we thought, oh, we're, we thought this is gonna be a good thing, a tenth for saving, no. A tenth will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it's cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. We have to remember that the first dispersion of the children of Israel and right here, the dispersion of Judah really destroyed lots of the children of Israel. And he left a remnant. You're part of that remnant. He's calling you right now back to obedience. He's awakening the faith in you because you are part of the tenth that has continued and he has kept his eye on you for your good and because of his promise to your father Abraham. And if you are, if you are a physical Gentile, he loves you and is grafting you in. You become part of Israel. And so what we must remember is that if God didn't spare them, and Paul says scarcely, you know, well, it talks about in the scriptures that we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It says right here in this chapter, woe to those who say, hey, bring on the day of the Lord. Great. No, no. We are a wicked, unholy, unrighteous people who will be, what? The filth, of our filth, like we said in chapter four, our filth will be purged by the spirit of judgment and fire. Whew. We need to know our place. This is what we've been talking about for a few weeks. We really need that deference, that respect. Respect our authorities, spiritual, physical. We need respect our parents. We need respect. Now, if your parents are sinning against Yahweh, of course, you always choose Yahweh first. If your government's telling you to sin against Yahweh, you choose Yahweh first. If your husband or your spouse is choose, telling you to sin against Yahweh, you choose Yahweh first, okay? Verse, chapter 7. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel. So notice, again, here's the difference between the king of Israel and the king of Judah, two different houses, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. Yahweh protected um, Judah. Ex oh, yes, yeah, so exactly. Yes, I'm sorry, D. Yes, the us is the father and son, Yeshua and the father. Okay. Verse two, and it was told to the house of David saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. So they were afraid. So the house of David was afraid. The house of David are the Jews, right? Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, the southern kingdom. Ephraim was the 10 northern tribes of Israel who was first ruled by Jeroboam from the tribe of Ephraim. And these people came with Syria and were trying to destroy Judah. Then Yahweh said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and share Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And say to him, take heed and be quiet. Shechet. Do not fear or be faint hearted. So he's telling him, be quiet. Like, be still. Do not fear or be faint hearted. For these two stubs of smoking firebrands, talking about um, Ramalia and uh, the king of Syria and Ephraim, these two stubs of smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramalia, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have plotted evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and trouble it and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabel. So they're coming. So Yahweh's telling the king of Judah, don't fear. This is what they're saying. But thus says Yahweh Elohim, uh, says Adonai Yahweh, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and Damascus was the capital. And the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken. This is a prophetic picture of the 10 northern tribes of Israel being scattered by Tiglath-Pileser. 
So within 65 years, he says, Ephraim will not even be a nation anymore. They're going to be broken so that it will not be a people. Cue Hosea. Now we've gone through the book of Hosea together. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son. If you will not believe, surely you will not be established. So the king of Judah was told, you must believe this prophecy or you won't be established. And verse 10. Moreover, Yahweh spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from Yahweh or Elohim. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test Yahweh. <laughs> That's not the thing to do when Yahweh says to ask for a sign. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? So do you see right here, this is a story, this is a picture that I see of him. People try to be pious and righteous for God, thinking they're doing right and, and kind to him, when they literally disobey what he just told them to do. Oh, no, I would never ask for a sign. Yahweh's like, ask me a sign. Like, you're wearying me. I literally told you, ask for a sign. Like, And people miss the heart of God over and over and over. They miss his heart. They miss who Yahweh is. And I don't want that to be you. I don't want it to be me. We must know the heart of Yahweh. So be still and believe. Fear not and believe. Commit to the word Yahweh has told you and be steadfast. Be steadfast because you don't want to weary God with your doubt, with your fears, with your anxieties, with your lack of it. Oh, trying to be righteous and holy. Oh, I'm not going to test God. And God's like, I told you to ask for a sign. Some of you will relate to that, that I that, know, right? You need to have faith and be still and do what Yahweh calls you to do. Okay, um, here now, O house of David, is a small thing for you to weary man, but will, you all, but will you weary my God also? Verse 14, then Adonai himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Now let's go to the Hebrew with this verse. So when we look at the virgin, here it is the word Alma. And it is a marriageable young woman who is either newly married or not married and has not had relations. It's typically she's veiled. She hasn't had relations. Isaiah's wife was not a virgin. Do you see this was a prophecy, though, for Miriam, right? The sign of our, for, through, our through Yeshua's mother. Judaism misses this and they argue this. Oh, she wasn't a virgin. This is just blah, 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 blah. And then they'll try to say that this verse was added in. That's not true. If you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls from 2000 years ago to the modern scripts, we like, we see this. <laughs> like they didn't just add this in recently. This is here. So the sign given to Isaiah was that his wife would bear a son and... No, not his wife. I'm sorry. His wife's going to have a son over here. I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out how to say this because I'm thinking about the Judaism argument. But the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Now we know that's Yeshua. We know it's a prophecy of Miriam. That's the sign that Yahweh is going to save the tents of, Ju of Judah. Okay, let's just take it this way. Who is in the land of Israel when Yeshua was born? Like during the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who were the whole New Testament? Who was in the land of Israel? Yep, Isaiah did have a wife. Who is in the land of Israel? Just the Jews. Judah, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. So he gave, he says in the book of Zechariah, he's going to save the tents of David first, the tents of Judah first. Okay. In that land, this sign was given to Judah. Ephraim had already been scattered. Who came against, who came against the Jewish nation in 70 AD? The Romans. The Romans epitomize, they're the epitome of the tribes of Ephraim because the Ephraim became the Medel Hagoyim who went to the European and America, European nations in America. They were the Christian nations. They became the Christians. So Rome, the harlot of Revelation, and her daughters, who are the Protestant harlots, epitomize the people who came against. So Christians come against the Jews once again. Romans came against the Jews, okay? So you got to think about all these pictures as they're happening. 
when we look at the end days, where have I told you very specifically, where do we know the Antichrist will come from? It's a mix of the Roman Catholic Church with the tribe of Dan. <laughs> again, the Ephraimites going to come against the true Israelite, you and me. Now, I'm a blood Jew. Some of you are blood Jews. Some of you are not. Do you see these prophetic pictures? Do you see these prophetic pictures? So, Rome came against Judah. Right here, right here we had Assyria. See, the northern tribes of Israel were scattered by Assyria. Assyria and Israel were joined here when they came against Judah. Yahweh delivered them. And his sign that, that his deliverance was going to happen was through the virgin having a son. So this is a prophetic picture of the ultimate deliverance of Israel. Because the son that came, I don't remember how many years after this, what was it? Hmm. Was it 600 years later? I'm trying to do the math in my head. Um, the son that came, Yeshua HaMashiach, when he was born, was a sign. He was the deliverer of Israel. Does that make sense? Um, does that make sense? Okay, and Nelly, we've talked, I'm not going to do that right now because we've talked about that a lot in my videos. If you go to There Is No Preacher Rapture, it'll be on there. But we're going to stay focused right now and then we can come back to that later at the end. Okay, so the sign was given. Does it mean that the sign happened at Isaiah's day? I don't think so. Isaiah's wife had a child, and you're going to see that, but it doesn't say that the sign came in that day. I was thinking, my mind was going somewhere different earlier. Um, sorry. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Curds and honey, that's like cottage cheese. Those of you who have raw milk and know what I'm talking about. And honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, <laughs> so the milk of the word and honey is that, that kindness, the satiation, the, the, the richness of God. Like he understands, because the curds, that's the fat. That's the good, that's the choice. Tristan, it's yummy, it's yummy. Um, the curds are like the choice fat of the milk, okay? And it's with honey. So he's going to eat that in a humble, he's going to be humble so that he knows to refuse evil and choose the good. For, but this is where, okay. So before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Now, this is talking about those two kings that were taken off. There is speculation. This is what I was trying to get at. And some people think that Isaiah's wife had a child that symbolized this. Some people think there was a, different person that may have been a symbolic picture of this happening because the child was going to before the child would know to refuse the evil and choose the good then the king of assyria and israel Ephraim would be you know punished then okay so verse 17 yahweh will bring the king of assyria upon you and your people and your father's house days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from judah again Confirmation, Ephraim and Judah were separated. And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh will whistle for a fly that is the farthest part of the rivers, that is in the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that's in the land of Assyria. They will come, and all of them will rest in its desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rocks, and on all thorns and in all pastures. In the same day, Yahweh will shave with a hired razor with those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs. Now, Listen, and will also remove the beard. So for a man, that's a symbol, that's a, like a symbolic of kind of taking his covering off. It's like, like a woman, her hair, if you shave her, it's a, it's a yucky thing. So for a man to have all this removed is kind of like removing his covering, removing his manhood from him. It shall be in that day that a young man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. So it shall be from the abundance of milk they give that he will eat curds, that's the cottage cheese, for curds and honey, everyone will eat who is left in the land. It's to humble them. It's because that's all they have. They're not going to have the onions and the leeks of Egypt. They're going to be humble. It shall happen in that day that whatever there could, whenever, wherever there could be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, it will be for friars and briars and thorns. With arrows and bows, men will come there because all the land will become briars and thorns into any hill which could be dug with the hoe. You will not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but it will become a range for oxen and a place for sheep to roam. So he's talking again about the judgment coming. And he's talking about, um, yeah, so he's saying, look, I'm going to break Ephraim and the and, and resin of Amalia. I am going to bring down these two smoking firebrands. They're not going to come against you. Don't fear, be established. 
and and then he's talking about within 65 years it's going to happen when this virgin has a child now the reason some jews struggle with this is because they're like well there was at this time they don't know any virgin that was pregnant and then had a baby okay um plug your nose danielle you're silly and so that's where some people in judaism struggle with this passage but i see very very clearly that this was a prophetic picture of messiah when he came right the virgin did conceive and have the son now it could be like they said a young woman or whatever um but right okay we eat cottage cheese on stew street i love cottage cheese i eat so much cottage cheese oh my gosh okay that chapter really Sometimes Isaiah has this book of poetry, like a, a section of poetry that's really just talking about prophetic, but it's also showing like what's going to happen. So he was going to protect Judah. He was going to destroy Ephraim. And then I think it was prophetic pictures of what did happen and what's coming again for the end days. Okay, questions about this, about this, not about Chiver Dan. <laughs> questions about this chapter before we go on. You guys are all stuck on cottage cheese. <laughs> Jody and I make cottage cheese. Um, wouldn't Joseph have to be his father to be in the line of David? Wouldn't Joseph have to be his father? Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, in Judaism, like my mother, my grandmother, we're all Jews. And so I know it's kind of weird. They say, well, that proves you're Jewish because you know you came from that woman. and She was Jewish, which is ridiculous. He came from the tribe of Judah because both Joseph and Miriam were from the tribe of Judah. Usually you intermarried within the tribe that you were within. And so he came in that lineage kind of in the order of Melchizedek, like, right, spiritually, supernaturally. Some people try to say he physically was Joseph's son. No, the Immaculate, the Immaculate, um, blah, blah, blah. what am I trying to say? You can tell I'm tired tonight. The Immaculate Conception, the birth of Yeshua, was the Holy Spirit on Yahweh. He is the Son of God who came. And it came through the tribe of Judah, through Miriam. Like, Joseph is his father, like, adopted father. But he was physically through Mary. Miriam is her name in Hebrew. And he, she was a Jew. And so, that he's still Jew. And he's from the tribe of Judah. When he returns, he comes in the lineage of the line of Judah. Um... Yes, exactly. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome, Morgan. But what he's talking about is why would Joseph not, wouldn't Joseph, the Joseph in the Bible, Joseph and Miriam, wouldn't that have to physically be her, his dad to be from the lineage of Judah? No, he came through his mother. And that's not the same Joseph. So it's, does that make sense? Okay, I hope that makes sense. That was a good question, actually. Um, I feel like you have to really twist your mind and not see it. I, I agree, Cassandra. I agree. And, and I just recently came upon like some of the fights and I was just like, ah. So I was trying my mind, as you can see, was trying to formulate answers for some of those fights while I was reading. And then I was like, let's just read. <laughs> so you saw me just like, no, I'm not gonna formulate the arguments against their anti-Yeshua uh, rhetoric. Okay, um, I have finally found my people where I belong. Oh, these are good people, girl. These are good people. Hi, Shanika. Um, these are really good people, really good people. You're going to love them all. Join us Friday night. The next meeting is Friday night Zoom unless I get enough energy, but I have somebody I think who wants a counseling session tomorrow night, so I probably can't. See, that's the other thing. When I'm counseling y'all, I don't have enough time to do the lives because I got to do that. Um, and so if you ever need you know, counseling, we just set it up in advance and we do it via Zoom. Um, let's keep reading. This is where I was talking about, um, this is where I was talking about Isaiah's children. Moreover, Isaiah chapter 8. Oops, I run into one issue. He came through the woman only. I ran in, I run into one about issue. Right. You, they do, Cassandra. You're right. They, they do. Um, but they will still fight that the, there was no such thing as a virgin birth. That's what they fight about. Um, <laughs> I actually say it quite a bit, Danielle. I do say it a lot, but I know. Maybe you guys are rubbing off on me. <laughs> okay. Moreover, Yahweh said to me, take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hazbaz. Now that means speed the spoil, hasten the booty. And I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of um, Jeberechiah. Jeberechiah. Then I went, listen, then I went to the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son. So this is Isaiah's wife. 
Then Yahweh said to me, Call his name Macher Shalal Hajbaz, for before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. So this is prophetically again showing how the king of Assyria is going to come against um, Israel and take away the ten northern tribes of Israel. This is what, this is why I needed to keep reading there. This is what they say, oh, this was the virgin who conceived and she wasn't actually a virgin. So some people believe this was the sign that the previous chapter was talking about. And that's what I was trying to get through there, but I needed to read this to see that. Now, it could have been, like there are things that will happen in your life that are prophetic pictures for Israel. God will show you something to pray for. We see in scripture where things will happen not exactly the same way. So possibly, was this a sign that the prophetess, you know, maybe she was a virgin when he went into her. and But but it wasn't an immaculate conception in this, this arena. That It wasn't at all. He, Isaiah went into her. However, when we get to the story of Moses, or I mean Joseph and Miriam, Mary, we see very clearly it was the Holy Spirit that it, that put the the seed of the Father into Mary. He wasn't just a man. I've heard a lot of blasphemous teachings lately that Yeshua was just a prophet, not not God. That just doesn't work. In the Hebrew language, it says that us make man in our image. We just read it a little bit ago. Who will go for us? Yahweh Yeshua is God. Um, yes. Isaiah, most people are. If you are a prophet, usually you'll be put with a prophetess. Most people, their spouses, the husband and wife duo, are from the same tribe. You, If you start praying about things and looking at your the little nuances that God's put, like I am positive my husband's from the tribe of Levi. His whole family had a history of um, teachers and pastors, even though they were really, had some dark history there too. Um, he has a very strong gift of prophecy, like very strong gift of prophecy. So anyway. Thank you, Stanley, for sharing that. So Mark 1 says it clearly. Okay. Okay. So those in Judaism, sometimes I just give you these this information so you know how to rebut, especially because like Cassandra, you go, like in Florida, you have a lot of Jews you can share with. Um, they really have no one, they really believe that the Yeshua could not have been immaculately conceived and that he wasn't the son of God, but he is the son of God. Genesis chapter one, the word Elohim is plural, right? Hello, Shalom, Christina. Um, most, exactly, not all right. Um, even if we're, a lot of people are unequally yoked. But even in that case, sometimes you'll find out that you have been led to that person. That person is resisting God. Okay. Verse 5. Yahweh also spoke to me again, saying, Inasmuch as the people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly and rejoice in Rezin and in Ramalia's son, now therefore, behold, Yahweh brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria and all his glory. Here the river represents the king of Assyria coming over the children of Israel because they rejected they rejected the, Shil the waters of Shiloh. Interesting. We just read, like, what, two chapters ago that the reason the judgment was coming upon the children of Israel was because they forsake, forsook the law of Yahweh. Isn't it interesting that if you just, in returning and rest, you will find your peace? Right? If you just accept the law of Yahweh, he gives you peace and, and, and security for your soul. In just obeying, that's the waters of Shiloh. Like, that's the peace because he doesn't have to punish you. Like, have you ever had a child who's wayward? And you're like, if you would just obey, I don't have to discipline you. If you just obey, I don't have to punish you. And that's like, yeah, but he's like, if you, if you just obey, like, the, the law, then, then, then you have the waters of Shiloh all around you. There's peace. There's peace because you're just obedient. Now, therefore... Um, behold, Yahweh brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria and all his glory. He will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck and the stretchings out of his wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. Here's again a prophecy, a picture uh, talking to Yeshua. Whose land is that? Yeshua. Because who's going to be king of the earth from Jerusalem? Yeshua. Emmanuel. God with us. Be shattered, O you peoples, and be broken in pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. When there is something stated twice, typically in Scripture, it is like a sign of surety, and that's you. Can, you can think of it as like a double witness. Gird yourselves, like shore yourselves up. But you're still going to be broken. You can come to me, and you can try to fight me, but you're still going to be broken. Hi, Nicole. Hello, Kayla. I guess I should say. Now, Kayla, this will be posted on Facebook Live videos under the, my page and the videos after we're done. So feel free to look at that um, later. If you would like to see the rest of it, you go 10 minutes in and then we began the teaching. Verse 11, 
For Yahweh spoke thus to me with a strong hand, instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. And I'm going to say he's telling you guys that. Do not, do not say it's a conspiracy to follow the Torah. Do not say that it's a conspiracy that there's no preacher of rapture. There's no preacher of rapture. It's not. It's not a conspiracy. It's the truth. Get ready to go. Don't be afraid of their threats. Don't be troubled by what they're saying. Yahweh Sevaot, him you shall hallow. Him you so that you respect him, you reverence him. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary. Listen. But a stone of stumbling and a rock of So wait a minute. He's going to be a sanctuary. But a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. Let's pause on that. Who are the two houses of Israel? Both the houses of Israel. Both the houses of Israel. Well, everybody knows how the Jews, there's the Jews, and then there's the Christians, the Israelites, the Ephraimites. Many of the ten northern tribes of Israel became the modern Christians. Both houses stumble on him. So this is something you need to share with your friends who are you're trying to understand, help understand about the Torah. Judah, un, how did Judah stumble over the Messiah? How did Judah stumble over Emmanuel? How did he stumble? I'm going to let some of your comments come in here. How did Judah stumble over the Messiah? How did Judah stumble? Because he was a stone of stumbling and rock offense. Why? Why did they stumble over him? Why did they stumble over Yeshua? They may answer. Exactly, Cassandra. They denied him as the Son of God. Exactly, Daniel. They missed him. Now, let's turn it around. I ask Christians all the time this. I say, so who's the other house? And I get this look. I'm like, no, it says both houses stumble over Messiah. How's the other house stumble? And they're like, what other house? Aha. 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 Two houses of Israel. See, Christians think they're closer to God than the Jews. But the Bible literally says that Judah offends less than Ephraim. That idolatry is worse to God. <laughs> it's worse to God than almost anything. And the blatant disobedience of his law. So the first house, the Jews, they stumble over the Messiah because they did not recognize him the first time. Many in Judaism did not. But the second house, the house of Ephraim, the ten northern tribes that were scattered and became the Melech Hagoim, the fullness of the Gentiles, the ones who became the population of the Christian nations, the European and Americas. You know how they stumble over the Messiah? How do they stumble over the Messiah? They stumble over the Messiah Exactly, Cassandra. They deny the obedience of the law. They don't think that Messiah is a law-giving, Torah-obedient Jewish man. They stumble over the Messiah because the Messiah taught to obey the Torah, but they reject obedience to his laws. See, the Jews reject that this even was the Messiah. The Christians will not obey the Messiah. So they think they're, they're trying to follow, they're trying to make him lawless. So both houses stumble over this rock he's a stumbling and he's a stone of stumbling in a rock of well, he is our stone he's the rock on which we build and he is a stumbling block to both houses of israel this is a huge point you can make with christians it is i make this all the time like who's the other house like jews stumble because they denied yeshua but you're stumbling because you deny that he's the law giving obedient son of god by the way I'm getting ready to plant my onion, my onion bulbs and they stink so badly. So the whole time I'm down here tonight, I'm just like, if you see me kind of like making a, like a vomity face, it's because they stink. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So they shall be broken and they shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. 16. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. That's you. Get that word in your heart. Bind up the testimony. Hold it. Seal the law among yours. Get that word, that Torah in your, you're his disciples. You know what the word disciple means? Tell me, it's the word Talmudim. It means students. Put that word of God in your heart. The Torah, the law of God. 
and I will wait on Yahweh who hides his face from the house of Jacob. During this tribulation, the father is going to hide his face from us and we must have the law sealed up in us and bound in us. You must get that word in your heart. What have I told you? What have I told you? What have I told you? You don't need me to teach. I mean, yes, we're going to go through the teachings together. You better get in that word. You better get in that word and go in it again and again. And with the podcast goes chapter by chapter. We're in second Kings right now. But the most important word you have is the law of God, because that will tell you if it's of God or not. That's the very essence of God himself that he gave to Moses on the mountain. Deuteronomy 13 says that every single person has to speak according to that law. If they don't, it's a false prophet. Okay. So see a bind up the testimony seal the law among my disciples, the students, that's you. And I will wait on Yahweh who hides his face from the house of Jacob. He's going to hide his face for this tribulation coming. And I will hope in him. You guys don't lose your hope. It's going to be tough. We're going to be washed with the spirit of burning and judgment. Well, the other, right? We just read that in chapter four. Ooh, don't lose hope. That's why right now, if you have a disciplines, you corrects you, teaches you, be joyful. Do not be condemned. Do not get pouty. Do not get angry. Do not let Satan come in. You be humble. You be humble. You be humble. Verse 18, here am I and the children whom Yahweh has given me. Now he tells me all that, that all the time with you guys and with the people I've taught for 20 some years. We are for signs and wonders in Israel. You're for a sign and wonder in Israel from Yahweh Sebaot, who dwells in Mount Zion. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wiz wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Nope, we're not even supposed to talk to the dead, right? Listen to verse 20. This should be your model. You should have this memorized. If anybody talks to you about Yahweh, you better have this come out of your mouth. To the law and the test to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Remember Genesis chapter 1? The light and darkness existed before the sun, moon, and stars. Light is Yeshua. If you want to have the light in you, you must have the word of God in you. Yeshua is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The very essence of God's nature is that Torah. It does not save us, but it is his light to us. It lights our path. Thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. It is the light. If they do not speak according to the Torah, the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. And that's a hard one to swallow. But it's the truth. So those people you love so dearly that are not speaking according to the law and the prophets, there is no light in them. They are filled with Satan, who is of darkness. There's the realm of light, Yahweh Elohim, and darkness. Light, Torah, Yeshua. We're told over and over and over in Scripture, the Torah is the light. The Torah is the lamp. Yahweh is the light. Yahweh is the lamp. Yeshua is the lamp. Yeshua is the light. And Satan is the darkness. Satan is the man of lawlessness. Yeshua is the lawful one. Law, obedient, Torah, obedient, Messiah, Mashiach of, of the house of Judah. If they do not speak according to the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. Do not listen to them. Hightail it and run. They will pass through it. Listen, this it is the tribulation coming. It was also the judgment coming them. Because these people who have no light in them, they think there's a preacher of rapture. They don't understand their wretchedness. We do. We see we're of unclean lips. We see we're wretched, that we need a savior. We see that because we have the Torah. The Torah is the light and we see our darkness in the, in the shadow of that light. And we're begging Yahweh to help us and forgive us and be merciful to us and help us overcome. Whereas they are arrogant and boastful and say, hasten the day of the Lord. Do you see all this prophecy here? And they will pass through it hard pressed and hungry remember it says many will come through the tribulation they will hunger no more they're going to be hard pressed and hungry because they were expecting a pre-trib rapture here's what's going to happen and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse the king and their god and look upward you better preach like never before that there's no pre-trib rapture because if not when they're when they're unawares of it and they're unprepared they are going to turn and curse god because they were like they thought it was easy they thought they didn't have to change they thought there was no repentance they thought there was no born again nature that needed to come do you understand 
Wow, I love Isaiah. I love this book. When don't us, we can't curse our God. We're going to be hard pressed and hungry. It's going to be hard, this tribulation. We literally just read in chapter four that he brings on us a spirit. Of, he's going to purge us and purify us, wash us with a spirit of judgment and burning. It's not going to feel good, people. It's not going to feel good. We're waiting for the end result. We're waiting for when it's all done and we can pop out of the fire refined. These people who are unprepared and who have been taught that they will be whisked out in a pre trib rapture will turn and curse their God because they were not prepared. They are going to be hard-pressed and hungry, and they did not understand what was coming. That's why we must be prepared. People are said. They tell me all the time, what's it matter? What's it matter? Why are you hung up on this no preacher of rapture thing? Why does it matter what you believe? Because this verse is why I do it. Because I don't want them to be unawares. I want them to see when they've like not been raptured out of here. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm still here. Remember this. Don't be enraged with the God. But if you were taught a pushover God who was false and you stumbled over the false Messiah who was lawless and didn't teach you and didn't punish you and didn't refine you, um, this tribulation is going to be hard. But for those of us who have come into understanding of his Torah, we understand that we're wretched, wicked people who need to be refined and purified and humbled. I'm always like, not bring it on because I want it, but I'm like, Lord, I just want you to get all of me out of me. <laughs> like, I don't want, ouch. I don't want, sorry guys, I don't want me anymore. <laughs> I don't want any of me. I don't want the defensiveness to my husband. I don't want to be prideful. I don't want to get hurt feelings. I just want to love. I want to be merciful. I want to be kind. I don't want to have any bloodshed on my hands. I don't want any of that. Lord, I always say, just break me. Break me of me. Oh, the J.J. Heller song, you guys know that? Um, what's that song? It says, um, scenes of you come rushing through. You are breaking me down. And it's talking about getting the, please kill the liar. Please kill the thief inside. Oh, it's such a beautiful song. And I, I relate so much to that because when you know Yahweh and you come to his Torah, you can't be proud or arrogant because you're like, ooh, I suck. <laughs> I suck. And my righteousness is like filthy rags. Well, I'm trying, Lord. Don't give up on me. And then you're like, well, look, he came to me at my suckiest. So he ain't going to give up on me. I'm going to have faith because I didn't, I definitely didn't get saved because of my works. I definitely didn't get chosen because of my works because I was not a good girl. So praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh. Okay, verse 22. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Okay, that is a huge prophecy for the end times. Are you guys okay to go another chapter? Do we need to stop? Um, awesome, Jess. Keep going. Thumbs up or stop. So definitely got one person there saying keep going. Okay, keep going. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed as when he at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. So Galilee actually was on the border of the Gentile nation of Assyria. The northern tribes of Israel were scattered by Assyria. He lightly esteemed the ten northern tribes, took them away. Verse 2, the people who walked in darkness. Where was Yeshua born, by the way? Nazareth of Galilee. The people who walked in darkness, did I say that backwards? I don't know. Have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So those, remember in that when Yeshua was there and he was in Israel, but these ten other tribes have been scattered. They were being cast off. They've been in the darkness. But Yeshua came to the, the house of it, Judah, and he says he has sheep of another fold. And remember he talked to the the um, woman at the well who said, well, our father Jacob worshiped, uh, drank from this well, but you Jews have nothing to do with this. She knew she was a dispersed of Israel. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. That light is Yeshua. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them, a light has shined. So the 10 other tribes, this is a prophecy that we're going to get scattered, but God was going to come and bring them back. Part of the prophecy of Messiah in Isaiah 49 is that he's going to restore the dispersed of Israel. You have multiplied the nation and it's increased its, and increased its joy. Now, this is, for those of you studying Hebrew with me, this is one of those completed acts. It's in the future tense. Morgan, are you listening? Morgan, this is one of those things. It's talking in the future prophetically about something completed, but it hasn't yet been completed. It's going to be completed. It's will. He's speaking it as though it has been, right? He's speaking it into existence, but it's not going to happen right here. 
in the book of Isaiah. Okay. So the, um, those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them, a light has shined. That was a prophetic picture of Yeshua. He was, it's past tense, but it's actually, um, part, you know, it's, it's actually in the future. It was a completed perfect tense action. Okay. The P, um, verse three, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. So this is a prophecy of he's going to save them. For every warrior sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. <laughs> what's, how is this going to happen? Where is this, what's this light that's going to be shined to his people? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Oh my gosh, my eyes just started watering. I just love him so much. Is that not beautiful? Is that not beautiful? This is a prophecy of the light that would come would be Yeshua HaMashiach, the Savior of the world, the one who two chapters ago said he would be born of a virgin. Do not. I just had somebody reach out to me last week who was interviewing me, and he truly believes that this virgin birth didn't happen. No, it did. Yeshua was born of a virgin. He is the Son of God. And he was trying to tell me that, Ms., that Yeshua is not God. Yes, he is. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That is my Messiah. That is your Messiah. Let's read those words in Hebrew. Do you want to do that? Oh, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, Hamishra, Mishmo, Vaikra, Shmo, Pele, Yoit, I'm sorry, Yoit, El, Gavor, Avi, Ad, Sar, Shalom. Okay, let me. Um, I want to see what we're, we're this talking about. Misra. Yep, I so. Let me, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to read this in Hebrew to you. Um, so we're going to start here with Pele. Pele means wonderful. Where am I at? Okay, so um, Shemo. Here's his words. Shemo. So his name, his name, Shemo. Pele. Okay. Yoetz el go, um, sorry, Givor avi. Ad Sar Shalom. That's how you say all that. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to go slow so you can practice with me if you go to Isaiah 9, verse 6. Again, Pele Yoetz El Gibor. Why was I saying that Gibor earlier? Sorry, Gibor Avi Ad Sar Shalom. Now, Sar Shalom, I love that. Sar Shalom is Prince of Peace. Again, Pele, wonderful. Yoetz El Gibor. Um, Gibor is, um, sorry, Counselor, no, mighty, 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 mighty. Counselor was the other one, sorry. Yoetz El Gibor, God Almighty, Avi, Father, and, and Sar Shalom. Hmm, I love that. Okay, I don't know why. I just want to give that to you if you want to practice that in your Hebrew. Miss Morgan and Danielle and Cassandra, who's ever doing the Hebrew, and Jesse, if you guys are doing the Hebrew. Okay, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. I want to say here, this is why some of the Judaism Jews reject Yeshua as the Messiah, because have all of these names applied to God, had applied to Yeshua yet? Nope. He is going to come back and rule as the king of Israel, right? Ezekiel 40 to the end, specifically 45. So they're like, oh, look, he's not, he didn't come. He didn't, he's not the king yet. He's not the king David. Well, he's going to, he's going to, of the increase of his government. So when Yeshua returns now the second time, of, his, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. That's pretty beautiful. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. So when he comes back the second time, he is going to be on the throne of David reigning. Please read Ezekiel 40 to the end, specifically 45 to the end. The zeal of Yahweh Sebold will perform this. Adonai sent a word against Jacob and it shall fall, it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen, but, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Like, like Yahweh let them be destroyed and they didn't repent. 
and they arrogantly say, well, we're just going to, we're just going to cut them down or we're going to rebuild them. We're going to replace them. Hi, Jenny. Therefore, Yahweh shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and spur his enemies on. So Yahweh is going to bring the enemies. See, this is a thing that people don't understand that when you fight against Yahweh, he will bring your enemies against you. Now, we're also persecuted for our faith by the enemies. So there's, don't always just assume you're in sin, but also don't assume you're not in sin. Just everything be done with prayer, right? Um, adversaries of resin again, is verse 12. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind. The Philistines are the Palestinians. And they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Yahweh Sebot. What do I always tell you? Turn to Yahweh. If you're, in, if you're being afflicted, if something's happening, say, Father God, what did I do? Teach me. How did I sin? Don't go to a doctor. Turn to the one who strikes you. Right? If you've lost money, if you've had a bad business deal, if something happened, turn to the one who strikes you. Um, let's see. Actually, it is, if you, Matthew, um, if you understand Hebrew, it's the word teshuvah teshuv. It's the, it is, it says over and over and over and over, repent, repent. That's what the whole spirit of um, Elijah is. Anyway, um, for the people not to, okay, verse 14, therefore Yahweh will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. The elder and honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. Okay, so the elder and honorable, some of the elders, and then the prophet who teaches lies. Well, that's like every Christian pastor out there. Every um, Judaism person, they're teaching lies. They're going to be the tale. For the leaders of this people cause them to err. And you see that amongst all the children of Israel, the ten northern tribes that were scattered. And those who are led by them are destroyed. Remember, we just talked about the last chapter. If they don't speak according to the law and the testimony, there's no light in them. And they're going to be destroyed because of that. They're going to be entering into judgment. We read that in chapter 5. That the reason the judgments come upon them is for disobedience to the law of God. You don't get punished by God for obeying. And part of the obedience to the, to the, the law of God is that you would accept the Messiah. You would understand the need for a Messiah. You would see the law points out our need for the Messiah, right? It's our tutor that brings us to him, and then we don't throw away the information. We use it. We employ it. Okay. 17. Therefore, Yahweh will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burns as the fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. Through the wrath of Yahweh, of old, the land is burned up. And the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Listen. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim. Ephraim, Manasseh. Remember, those are the two sons of Joseph who became the leaders of the ten northern tribes of Israel. Specifically, Ephraim did. Together, they shall be against Judah. There's the enmity between Jew and Gentile, Judah and Ephraim. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. I want to go two more chapters. I want to get through chapter 11 so you can see more prophecies about the ten northern tribes of Israel who are many of the modern Christians. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune, which they have prescribed to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment and in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your glory? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners and they shall fall among the slain. Yahweh does not want us to forsake the widows or the fatherless. We are to look out for them. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. Now, this is when the, the king tiglath pileser came against the ten northern tribes of Israel. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Yet he does not mean so. So he said, like, Assyria doesn't even know why I'm using him to, to judge my people. Nor does his heart think so. Like he doesn't understand that I'm using him. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. For he says, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalon like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? Therefore it shall come to pass, when Adonai has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on, Mount, on Jerusalem, that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. 
So if you come against the children of Israel and you're arrogant and haughty, Yahweh might use you to punish us, but then you're going to be judged. For he says, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. So this is a serious saying, like I did it my own strength. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also, I have removed the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasury. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like the nest, like a nest, the riches of the people. And as one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing, nor opened his mouth with even a peep. This is the arrogant boast of Assyria. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? It's like, who do we think we are, right? Just because I get the prophetic word or just because God gives me dreams, I can't boast. You can't boast when you're given prophetic dreams from God and he uses you to speak to the truth. We're nothing. We're implements in his hand. And so here's Assyria being arrogant and saying, and God's saying to Assyria, like, really, you're gonna, you're, you're the ax in my hand and you're going to boast? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or as if a staff could lift it up, as if it were not wood. Therefore, Adonai Yahweh Sebaot will send leanness among his fat ones and under his glory. He will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and his holy one for a flame. It will devour, it will burn and devour. The light of Israel, that's Yeshua. Yeshua is for a fire. Yeshua is our light. That's the same as the Torah. It says the Torah, the law of God. The word of God in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word is God. Yeshua HaMashiach is the word of God. He is going to, that Torah is what's going to fire, come against the God's people. If you break the law of God, that is what will judge you from the mouth of Yahweh, from the mouth of Yeshua HaMashiach. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day, and it will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob, and that's you guys, that's us, right, will never again depend on him who defeated him. We were scattered by, the, well, my family was Jewish, so but many of you were scattered by the ten northern tribes, or by the Tiglath Pileser of Assyria. You became the ten northern tribes of Israel. You became the Gentile nations. I'm sorry, you were the ten northern tribes of Israel, who became the Gentile nations of the Christian faith. And you are never going to rely anymore on that, right? We're not going to rely anymore on Assyria, but just on Yahweh. So we're going to depend on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. The remnant, that's the remnant, the remnant that was saved will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. That's again the prophecy of Messiah. It says he would bring up and raise up the, the lost ones of Israel, raise up the dispersed of Israel. That's Isaiah 49. For though my people, though, okay, I'm sorry. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. So Ezekiel 20, remember, says he's going to find all of his people, take us to the wilderness, and those who don't pass under the rod don't get to go back to the promised land. So if you don't come into the bond of covenant, if you don't begin obeying Torah, you don't get to make it to the promised land. That's Ezekiel 20. That's the awakening that's been happening for the last 30 years. Okay. For Yahweh, for, sure, for Adonai Yahweh Sevaot will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Therefore, thus says Adonai Yahweh Sevaot, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt for yet a very little while, and the indignation will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. Now, remember the second Exodus says Yahweh will bring us back from the nations and to the, um, from the land of Assyria to where we've been scattered. We also know that the Antichrist comes from the Christian church, the the um, the Roman system, which is both Protestant and Catholic, and the tribe of Dan. Those, those are the European Christian nations. Assyria also, though, is where who scattered us. And so when it talks about here, this is a prophecy of, again, the, the Antichrist. Um, and he's saying, like, look, the Assyrian is going to come against you, right? You're going to be judged, but just a little while. Just a little while, and then I'm going to save you. Because the second exodus that Jeremiah, write this down, Jeremiah 16 and Jeremiah 23 say the second exodus will be so great of the children of Israel, we will no longer talk about the, the um, exodus from Egypt. Okay, and here's Yahweh himself mirroring that. He's talking about, look, Egypt was hard on you. Assyria is going to be hard on you. So this whole tribulation again, like we just talked about what, the last chapter, or two chapters ago, the tribulation is, well, we talked about that in chapter four, that the tribulation is to purify us and, and refine us and to wash us with the spirit of judgment and burn and fire, right? So we know that when we were coming out with the first exodus, when God was first bringing us out of the nations of, of Egypt, Egypt was bad to us. 
you're going to be persecuted now by, quote, Assyria, the land to which you've been scattered. So you're, some of you are in Canada, some of you are in South Africa, some of you are in Britain, some of you are in America. You're going to be persecuted. And it says this, just like in the manner of Egypt, okay? So he's going to strike us. He's going to persecute us for a little while, three and a half years, right, of that tribulation period. And then the indignation will cease, as will my anger and the destruction. Does that make sense? Are you seeing that he's saying, <coughs> kind of like shelter in place, <laughs> you're going to be judged. I mean, we've just read that this whole book of Isaiah says that you're going to be judged, you're going to be purified, you're going to be refined. Those who don't obey the law and the testimony, right? If they don't, they have no light in them. If they do not speak according to the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. So Mr. Matthew, if you're speaking against the law of God, there's no light in you and you are possessed by Satan and you are consumed by Satan. And so it says that that's God's own words to the prophet Isaiah. So anybody who speaks against the law of God does have no light in them. And so when the tribulation comes against us, when the tribulation is refining us, those of us who have humbled, been humbled by God through the mighty, through his Torah, though we are, we're going to be like, okay, we get this. This is for, to purge away our filth. Those who are arrogant and prideful and do not understand the law, it says they will go through it hard pressed and hungry and turn and curse their God. We just read that. And that's because they think that they're so righteous and holy by lawlessness. And it's going to come as a surprise on them that their arrogance does not get received in God's eyes. Like we are not righteous people. Yahweh shed the blood of his son to cover us, to praise us, to cover us, to protect us, to provide for us. But we're not good people. We didn't deserve it. We didn't get saved because we were good. We got saved because we needed a savior. We were wicked. And then he calls us into obedience. So may we be prepared and understand, again, here's a bracing for the end days. We're going to be struck with the rod and the staff of Assyria, just like during the first Exodus. If you have no clue that the second Exodus is coming, again, it's Jeremiah 16 and 23. We are told the second Exodus of all of God's children, both Jews, Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, and the 10 northern tribes are going to come back. We read that in Ezekiel very recently, that Ezekiel says the house of Israel and the house of Judah are coming back to be one stick in Yeshua's hand. So, <clears throat> okay. Verse 26, and Yahweh Seba Olt will stir up a scourge for him like the slaughter of Miriam, Midian at the rock of Oreb. As his rod was on the sea, so will he lift it up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day. So he, he's going to judge Assyria like he judged Egypt for being hard to us. We're going to be treated badly. We're going to be persecuted. There's going to be a mark of the beast. There's going to be, we can't buy or sell. We're going to be really persecuted just like our fathers were in Egypt. Okay, when we came out the first time. And then Yahweh is going to turn and judge them just like he judged Egyptians. You notice how he judged all the gods of Egypt? He's going to judge the pagan Christmas God, the pagan Easter God. He's going to judge the pagan God of medicine. He's going to judge the pagan God of money. He's going to do that for us as well. Okay. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing of, because you are anointed, you are smeared. Remember that word anointing there is smeared in Hebrew. Smeared. You got to get the Yiddish in there. He has come to Ayath and he has passed Migron. At Michmash, he has attended to his equipment. They have gone along the ridge. They have taken up lodging at Geba. Ramah is afraid. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galim. Cause it to be heard as far as Laish. O poor Ananath. Madmenah has fled. The inhabitants of Gabim seek refuge. As yet, he will remain at Nob that day. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion. So you remember how Egypt was so angry at the Israelites? Is Syria is going to be so angry at us because for our sake, Yahweh is going to judge and judge and judge and judge the Assyrians who are being wrong to us. They're going to, we're going to be hard pressed and hungry. They're going to come against us. We're going to be persecuted. They're going to wear us out. It says the saints will be wore out. But Yahweh will be the refuge to us. He's going to be a sanctuary to us, but a stone of offense and a rock, a st a rock of stumbling to both the houses of Israel. Okay. Behold the Lord, Yahweh civil old will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. I want to do one more chapter and then I'm going to address some of the questions on here. Okay. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. That is Yeshua. And a branch shall grow out of its roots. We just read that again. Tzemach. Yeshua was called a Tzemach a couple chapters ago. The spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him. 
the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Yahweh. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of Yahweh and his delight is in the fear of Yahweh and the fear of Yahweh leads you into obedience of God. Fear of Yahweh leads you to reverence and obedience of God. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. And the poor is usually a synonym for um, humble in, in Hebrew. And decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. That's the word of God, the Torah, <laughs> the sword. And with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Now, the wicked are those who are lawless. Those are against the law of God. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goats. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. This is the star shalom, the peace, the peace that Yeshua will bring to the millennial kingdom. Very natural earth, but just under the peace of of Shalom, kind of like in the garden again. The um, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Verse 8, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, that is Mount Zion, Jerusalem. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. What did it say in Isaiah chapter 2 that's going to go forth from Mount Zion to all the earth? The law, the law, the Torah. The Torah will go forth from Zion when Yeshua returns. Okay, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who will stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. Wow, the Gentiles are going to come back to the Torah, back to obedience, back to Yahweh, that's what the book of Hosea also says, that the Gentiles, the 10 northern tribes of Israel that became the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles, get to come back and be his people, even though they were cast off as his people. And that's what Ezekiel says, that the dead bones of Israel arise and they come back to obedience of God. Okay, that Yahweh, listen, listen, please listen. Um, verse 11. It shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall set his hand, that's actually the word Adonai, shall set his hand again the second time, this is the second Exodus, to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. That is you, you believers who are clinging out of Torah, you who have awoken and coming out of the pagan, horrible, harlot system of the Catholic and Protestant church. That's you, he is recovering you. He has set his hand a second time to recover you, the seed of Zer the Zerah, the sperm of Abraham that has been scattered to the nations who lost their identity according to Hosea and Genesis 48. Listen. Okay, I'm sorry. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. This again proves the earth cannot be flat because according to the flat earth model, if they were literal and they said, then we should be leaving on ice berms in the corners of the model. If this is literal, and he's just going to just, just um, gather us from the four corners of the earth, then we can't be living in America because that's on the center on their flat earth map. The earth is not flat, but this is another understanding that the earth is not flat. The earth is not flat. Literally, oops, I just hit the wrong thing here. Let me go back here. Um, they always say, oh, look, at the earth has to be like the four corners, the four corners of the earth. That's that's symbolic. That's not literal. I'm in America. Many of you are in America. Some of you are in South Africa. If this was literal and we, there was four corners of the earth, we would be stuck in little ice berms in the corners of the, some weird model. This is l symbolic of where we've been scattered across the earth. Okay. So please remember that you can't twist scriptures so poorly where you're trying to say, look, there has to be four corners. No, it doesn't. Like we're not, then, then this would say that all the Israel and Judah are in those four little corners on those ice berms, not even on land. We're just floating on ice. That doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. Okay. Verse 13. Also, the envy of Ephraim shall depart. Notice how Christians are extremely jealous of the Jews because why? Because the Jews have the identity as God's people. They want to be God's people so bad and they were cast off so they don't understand that they are God's children, the dispersed of Israel. And the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. So those who harass us will be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. Both houses are going to come together. But they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines as the Palestinians toward the west. Notice how the Palestinians are on the west of Israel. Together, Judah and Ephraim are going to come down on them. 
Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. Yahweh will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind, he shall shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross. We're going to and cross over dry shot. We're going back to the land of Israel, like Ezekiel says. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel in the day they came up from the land of Egypt. Do not let anybody tell you there's no second exodus. Do not let anybody tell you we aren't going back to the land. Okay, now I can tell there's some crazy stuff going on here. Um, what does it mean the second time? So, the, so Randy, it means that second time is that's the second exodus. The, the Christians who are waking up right now to the pagan origins of their faith and coming out of the pagan faith and coming back to the truth of God, who are remembering the law of Moses, like Malachi chapter 4 says, and Judaism Jews who are leaving Judaism and accepting Messiah as Yeshua, that's the second exodus. Those people, God's remnant that he's recovering, that are coming back out of religion, they're leaving religion, and they're coming back just like the disciples who received Yeshua, right? Okay, um... Um, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, guys, I got, sorry. I didn't see what was all going on cause I wanted to keep focused on that. Um, but yeah, I, I, Morgan, she's my girl. So she's, I'm sure she did a good job. Um, Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Zedekiah. That's, yeah, exactly. Oh, Zedekiah, um, by the way, Zedekiah. Uh, I bet, huh. Lorenzo, did you make it on tonight? Are you here tonight? I don't see him. Um, and then I had another friend. I want to connect you with two Zedekiah, another guy who I was talking with today, who's another wonderful brother in the Lord. Um, so I just, and Justin, I connected him. Um, okay, I'm going to start fresh. I can't read all those comments. Okay. Yes, Shanika. Okay, so let's, okay. So, exactly, Cassandra. Good job. Okay, I, I don't know if Matthew's still on here. I, I pushed band. I don't know if it worked or not. We don't need that. I was giving him time to hear. I was trying to read to 11. I wanted to read through the end of 11 so then he can go ponder the word of God. We'll see. I don't know when he came on. I think he probably missed the part that he needed to hear. So the, the um, will when the when the people when Yeshua comes back, so do remaining human bodies or change to glorified bodies? So the people who are alive, it appears that well, like Paul says, we'll meet him in the clouds and and be changed. Right. It also shows that in the millennial kingdom, when we have the third temple, we will have the tree of life that will restore our bodies. So we will get to eat the tree of life if we keep the commandments of God. That's Revelation 22 verse 14. And then it talks about that in um, Ezekiel and Revelation about that. So it appears that we are rege rege regenerated. And those who are dead, of course, have to come back in new bodies because some of them have been beheaded or whatever. And so we don't want just these little heads walking around. So they're going to get new bodies uh, some in some form, right? And we saw Yeshua after he was crucified. So there's some kind of change that happens, sweetie, like at the end of the tribulation, after the tribulation, when we meet him in the clouds and, re and come to Mount of Olives with him to fight the battle, uh, the great battle. Some people are going to be in Israel and Jerusalem. Some people are going to be in around the nations. We'll meet him in the clouds, descend on um, Mount, uh, Mount of Olives with him because it says in Zechariah 14, he will come with his saints with him um, and then have that great battle. I hope that made sense. Um, let's see. Mm, what's your thoughts on the eclipse coming up? So I believe that's the beginning of the, the new, that's right at the beginning, the end of this year and beginning of the new year. And it's a very strong warning. We must be speaking, speaking, speaking. Like, of course, it goes over Nineveh, Nineveh, Nineveh. Well, Nineveh was eventually destroyed, but Nineveh did have a chance to repent and they were called to repent. So we must be like Jonah. We can't be mad at the people who are fighting us. We have to diligently and fervently be praying and interceding for them. Jonah got mad and angry and pouted and like, yeah, I'm just, why are you just going to forgive them anyway? No, let's pray for God to forgive them. We don't want anybody to have judgment come against them. We don't have the right to pray unmercifully. So we need to continue to cry out and pray for the repentance of Israel and for all of God's people to turn back to the Torah. Even if they're being nasty and angry to us, we have to be merciful and forgiving. And we have to love them and keep crying out and interceding. Judgment's coming, judgment's coming, judgment coming. And it is a warning to, that the end is coming to America. We will come down. We just read it. And it's like Assyria is going to be judged because see the people who are going to turn against us, right, are the lands to which we've been scattered. And we were scattered through Europe and into America. European and America, European nations in America are going to be, that's where the Antichrist is at. 
We know that there's a division coming with the ten, that kingdom of ten going to be set up. The ten represents the ten tribes of Israel. It also represents the European um, nations and the Christian nations to which it have been scattered. Um, and then it's talking about, remember in, in Daniel's vision where it talks about the, the clay being separated from the iron. And so that division, you're the clay, we're the clay, the iron are the other people. Those iron are going to come against us and judge us. They're going to be persecuting us. They're going to be uh, ravaging us. Just like we just read, like when they came out of Egypt the first time, Egypt oppressed them. We're going to be very oppressed. We're going to lose religious freedoms. We're going to lose our rights. We're going to be persecuted. Our land's going to be taken. We're going to be taxed heavily. We're going to be oppressed. We're going to be oppressed. We're going to be oppressed. But Yahweh, our God, is refining us through it, going to show himself as our God and bring us out. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, and that's, I think, what this eclipse is warning, like the end is coming. You said something about not taking money according to the book of Micah. Yes. Um... They preach for pay and prophesy for profit, and it's a bad thing. It's a bad, bad thing. Is it Micah chapter 3? Let me find it. Sorry. So this Bible is a little bit used. The cover's fallen off, and the back cover's fallen off. I have so many Bibles everywhere, and this one I just grabbed. <laughs> oh, I know, because I have Bibles, like, everywhere, and I'm like, okay, Micah. Um... Oh, by the way, yeah, just remember, I just read this, I just saw this in Micah chapter 6. It says, Yahweh sent before us Moses, Aaron, Aaron, and Miriam, even a woman. Women can teach. It doesn't say they can't. That's Paul has some weird misunderstood scripture, but there's no place in Torah that says not to. Joel chapter 2 says he's pouring out his spirit on men servants and maid servants. So if you're a woman and you heard the voice of God and you're hearing the voice of God, get out there and preach the word of God too. You speak. Man, woman, child, donkey, like God used a donkey to bail him, right? Okay, let me um, find the verse that says that. I think it's chapter 3. Mm, yes, chapter 3, verse 11, her heads judge for a bride, her bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Moses didn't get paid. Elijah didn't get paid. Nobody got paid to teach the word of God. If you're given, Elisha literally refused payment. If you're given the prophetic word of God, you don't have a right to make money off it. Um, can you talk to us about the children? If there's no preacher, what happens to the children? Well, sweetie, we're, God will protect them, but at the same point, it's going to be hard. Like it says, woe to those who, are, who have children and are nursing in that day. It's going to be tough. I'm not going to pretend it's going to be easy on the children. However, remember the children of Israel were told not to fear. And God said, you who feared for these children, those children get to go into the promised land. You don't. So just have faith in God. You got to stay faithful to him. Know that he will bring him through. He's going to, we're all going to be humbled and with our, with the children as well. Um, it's, he's going to take care of us. And it's for, remember, this is for our good. Ultimately, it's not to destroy us. It's to refine us and purify us. So yeah, I mean, it does say, woe to those who are nursing and with, you know, and with babes in that day. And that's because Yeshua says it's going to be harder on them. It is, but don't give up faith and hope because like the book, um, like the, Torah said to the Israelites, I think it was in Numbers, it's like, you're fearing that like these children that you're afraid of that I won't take care of? No, I'll take care of them. Okay. Um, I was thinking of the short season of the devil. Okay, I don't think I'm understanding, Randy. Maybe you're talking about something else there. Um, I had a dream of four tsunamis coming. People were covered, the ones who weren't watching. Okay, what are your views about the red heifer currently in the West Bank? Okay, so we do know there's going to... Okay, so that's a good question, Najla. Um, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, so we do need to have a red heifer. The Judaism gets a little bit crazy with this whole thing. Um, I do believe it's a sign. We do know there's going to be a third temple constructed. We do know... That they've been doing um, sacrifices every year for a few years at the Temple Mount because that's the only place you can do the Passover sacrifice. Um, and they're going to try to do it this year and cleanse it. There will be a, an agreement coming soon where we will have a temple and the temple will be defiled by the Antichrist. Again, just like Antiochus Epiphany was a foreshadowing of. So these red heifers, I do believe are signs for us to be watching. Like, okay, we're going to soon have the, the, the altar cleanse, the temple. We're going to have a temple that they cleanse and it's going to be a physical temple, physical temple. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really good to be watching all of that because we're going to have sacrifices. Ezekiel 45 says Yeshua will lead. He's going to cleanse after the tribulation. He's going to cleanse that temple and lead us in the offerings again. Um, awesome. Cool. I didn't even, I'm going to have to go back and read it later, Tristan. I just, I just knew, I saw Morgan kept popping on and he kept arguing with Morgan. I'm like, okay, she's got it. I know I don't even have to go read it all. I knew she'd have it. I was just thinking about that myself. Okay. I'm so glad I found you. Well, 
Awesome. And then Debbie, there's the podcast I make that goes chapter by chapter through the Bible. It's um, called God's Little Hummingbird. Um, somebody might want to link it again, Angela or Danielle or somebody who does that for me, Christina. Um, and then um, there's the videos on YouTube, God's Little Hummingbird. And um, I can give you those links. You can message me privately and I'll get to those. Um, next message. Yes. Oh, awesome, Dorothy. Praise Yahweh. You're, yeah, yeah, that's awesome, Dorothy. It's well loved. Yes, I have very many well loved Bibles, Shanika. It's like everywhere. <laughs> um, the book of, yeah, yes, okay. If the Bible is falling apart, the person, <laughs> you got it, Debbie. That's a good way to think about it. Um, um, there's, thank you, Danielle, for po posting that. Um, thank you. Oh, awesome, Jess. I love you so much. Um, yes. Hamas said they started the, um, that seminar because of the red heifers that Israel is hiding the most near Jerusalem. They are wanting to sacrifice as soon and destroy the rock of the dome. Is there? Right. Exactly. We're going to have something. Um, now, isn't it interesting that, of course, Israel knew about the Hamas war. Um, they stood back and let it happen so they could have this battle. Yahweh's in, Yahweh's in control. I do believe um, Netanyahu is the bad, is, I believe he's the bad shepherd of the end time of his people, Israel, of Judah. Um, he's like, he sold all of the health data to the who. Oh, it's just sad. It's just sad. Um, share the word. I just got a Torah. What Bible should I get? Okay, so the Torah is in the Bible. It's just Genesis to Deuteronomy. I prefer, Kayla, to have people read from the New King James Version Bible because God doesn't want to be complicated or confusing. The NKJV is extremely accurate according to the Hebrew. The NASB is a little more accurate, but the NKJV reads very well. And then I suggest you just start learning Hebrew. Um, and so I hope that helps, hon. Um, have you heard about the cicadas? Yes. Yeah, that there's supposed to be this huge cicada thing go like in Texas and stuff. Um Suppose I know, isn't that crazy? Do you know whatever happened to the Abraham? To um, so Kyla, well, he was spared. If you're talking about um, Isaac, he was spared and then he got married, like after you know what I mean. Um, if that makes sense, um, stay away from the Talmud. You got it, Danielle. I used to love bacon, now I can't stand to eat it. So, yay, praise Yahweh, Debbie. I know I had some guy reach out last week, it was so amazing. He said just, you know, keep up teaching. He goes, keep sharing. He goes, thanks to you. I'm no longer eating pork. I'm working out the other stuff. I'm probably not where you want me to be, but praise Yahweh. Like I was like, yes, praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh. Right. Keep going. Um, be watchful Ezekiel. Are they doing the cleanse after this year? We don't really know, um, Lee, because they're going to try to do the Passover offering in April. Of course we have the solar eclipse and then Passover and they're going to try to cleanse like the an altar because they have every implement built except for the temple itself so mm, i don't know um i had a dream of me being in israel when the third temple being that in night vision. that's awesome saying that's awesome yeah see i had a vision many years ago too of the third temple right at, during the tribulation how it was being defiled and people were in there desecrating it and then all of a sudden i was trying to feed people me and one other person were trying to feed them desperately and they were just trying to come against us and hated us and then all of a sudden i saw this huge explosion from the nuclear war and it ended and I saw the sun rising in Israel and I knew Yeshua had returned and I was so excited. Whew, I was so excited to have peace in the land. Um, yes, so Kyla, here's the thing. If there, when you go back to the beginning of the Bible, you will, you're told that God will never change and when he gave rules, he did not say follow these rules until the time of the Messiah. He said follow them forever. Paul Peter, and the New Testament writers were Jewish men who obeyed the Torah. And so when we get to, um, when you get to Peter's vision, I have a YouTube video about that. It had nothing to do with food. It was a symbolic, it was eight years after Yeshua died and rose from the dead. And Peter's like, absolutely not. I'm not going to eat anything common or unclean. This is eight years. Okay. And he, and, and God says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter wondered what the vision meant. But then it says the Gentiles came to him and he said, oh, then I understood God was telling me to call no Gentile common or unclean. He didn't say God said I could get up and eat a ham sandwich. Then if you look at Matthew 15 and Mark chapter seven, we see that the Judaism Jews come to him and say, hey, your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders and they eat food with unwashed hand. Now food doesn't include people, cyanide or pork, okay? food. They eat food with unwashed hands. And so Judaism teaches that that's a rule 
that they have to do. If you come back from the marketplace, you have to wash your hands. The Bible doesn't say that. The Torah doesn't say that. And so Jesus says, why do you set aside your, the commandments of God to hold to your traditions of men? And so he rebukes them for following man's traditions. And he goes on in Matthew 15 to say very clearly, but eating with unwashed hands is not what defiles a man. The issue is about unwashed hands. It was not, we can't extrapolate it out and make it about something it wasn't about. It wasn't a picture of, oh, you can eat people, cyanide, because I'm, I'm guaranteeing you, if you go drink cyanide, you're going to die. The stomach doesn't purify it and eliminate it. You're not going to be okay, right? You're going to die if you just go ingest a whole bunch of methamphetamine. So their whole logic doesn't even work with that argument, if that makes sense. Um, right, Austin, we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to, Austin. Ooh, and you asked a question earlier about the tribe of Dan. Okay, so the tribe of Dan if you go to Genesis chapter 48, the prophecy from Mo, um, Jacob to the tribe of Dan is that he would be the serpent by the way, the one who judges his people in the end days. It says these are the prophecies that will befall the people in the latter days. Well, we're told that Dan is the serpent by the way that judges the people. Hmm, interesting. If you look at um, Revelation chapter 7, Dan is the only tribe not sealed before the tribulation. There's a whole bunch more things, but those two right there really show, oh, wait a minute. So Dan is going to judge God's people during the tribulation during the latter days, and he's not sealed before the tribulation, which would indicate, oh, that makes sense. That's where the Antichrist would come from. He's not sealed. He's not protected. So there's the, yeah. And the tribe of Dan right now is, they have been linked to Britain, and Britain claims to have the throne of David very blasphemously. They're not Jews. They did not have the throne of David. They came from the tribe of Dan, not Judah. And so all sorts of interesting things there with that. Sorry, my, my eyes are starting to cross. I'm getting so tired. Um, I know, I know. Romaine, I, Canada is so wicked. Yeah, they please help Canada, please. Save your children that are there and please get this wicked government out of office and please save us all, Lord. Um, why did we change the Torah and add on other books and call it the Old Testament? So we don't change the Torah now. Um, the quote, it's called the Tanakh. It's not called the Old Testament in Hebrew. It's called the Tanakh, the scriptures. And so the Masorah text was, um, was put together by the Masoret scribes who were Jewish scribes who went, they, they understood the Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy, and then any book that validated that or was historically accurate and, and confirmed it, then they accepted it into the Masora text. And that's how we have what's called the quote, the Old Testament, but it's the Tanakh in Hebrew. So that's how we got that scripture. Um, it is so evil. Hi, Angela. Okay, God says not. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Let's remember Yeshua said all things must come to pass. Exactly. They have nine red heifers from Texas and Israel. Yeah. And they had, well, they took five over, four of them and remained pure, and they got nine more. Um, um, right, Kyla, people will say everything, but if it contradicts what God already said, then it's Satan in the garden trying to deceive. Did God really say? So here's the thing. God said forever not to eat pork. Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. And then people will say, like Satan working through them, like, Remember he came to Eve, Satan said, did God really say not to eat the fruit? And Eve's like, well, we can eat the fruit, just not this tree, right? And so people right now listen to Satan. He said, did God really say not to eat pork and shellfish? It's okay, we make it healthier now. And people are like, oh, okay, it looks good for food, so I'll eat it just like Eve, but we're not supposed to. Isaiah 66 verses four to five literally says when Yeshua returns a second time, he's gonna destroy those people eating swine's flesh. And he didn't set us up for failure, so stop eating it people so we don't get destroyed, right? Um, what do you think of the Tree of Life translation? Um, I don't know much about it. Some people really like it, Jessica. I haven't, um, I've seen it. It looked kind of interesting, but I honestly haven't read it all through. I've looked at it from a few things. My friend Trenton sometimes shares me things. My friend Paula shares me things. Uh, I honestly can't speak on that really well. I haven't compared the Hebrew text with it because I just kind of stay in my own little lane here and just, you know, um, exactly. Okay, cicadas. Yes, so Graciela. The cicadas are supposed to invade the land like heavily, heavily. The cicada bug is supposed to overcome us. Which, ooh. This summer, this spring and summer. Ooh, Tristan, awesome. The Torah is the teachings and instructions of the laws and Tanakh is the collection. Thank you, Cassandra, for putting up. This, exactly. Right, so the Talmud and what Cassandra's trying to say there um, is that, um, so the Torah and the Tanakh is to quote what we'd say Old Testament. The Talmud is an extra book that we reject and that um, 
it's not in the Bible, but that's Judaism that contains like over 1,100 extra laws and rules. Why do we suppose to stay away from them? Okay, because, Shanika, the, the, the Talmud is extra laws that Yeshua taught against. He kept saying, why do you hold your tradition of the elders? Well, the Tanakh is, I'm sorry, the um, Talmud is filled with the tradition of the elders that contradict the Torah. Religion makes it so you can't find Yahweh anymore. You can't see the truth. So when you go to church and you're taught all those religious lies, you can't really see the truth of Yahweh. When you go to Judaism and you go to synagogue and you're taught all these lies, you miss, you miss who Messiah is. So we just stay away from that. Thank you, Christina, for putting that. Um, so, well, Leviticus 11. So Leviticus 23, honey, is Daniel, is this the feast. Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 are the food laws. Um, how do you feel about the book of Jeshua? Enoch, stay away from it. The father told me to stay away from it. You, the modern book of Enoch was written by a person... Um, Hired by the Spanish king. He was commissioned by the Spanish king to go find it. So he goes to Ethiopia. They had always gone to Ethiopia before on trade routes. Just this one time he goes and he supposedly finds it. He writes it. It's so contradictory to Torah. So the Masoras, uh, the Masoret scribes understood when you looked at this modern book of Enoch, it's not the one that was talking about, they were talking about in the Bible. That script was lost. This person, they couldn't find it. It was like 1500. So the king, they go look and they find it in Ethiopia. This guy gets a lot of money from the king because he went and found the book the king wanted to find. And so contradictory to Torah, he just took, he had a little knowledge of scripture. So he kind of tried to make this story that was sensationalized, but it contradicts the Torah. It's not at all. And I heard the Yahweh in my ear say, stay away from it back in 2002. And then as people have brought me things from it, I'm like, that's not, that's not biblical. That's against the Torah. This is what the Torah says. And there have been a number of people who literally admit, oh yeah, well we follow, this is important to us. So we choose the Apocrypha over the, the Torah. No, everything's supposed to be compared to the Torah. So stay away from the book of Jasher and Enoch and just stay in scriptures. Um, thank you, James. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, and he actually, he didn't take away the sacrificial laws. That's another misunderstanding. He only, we lost the right. He took our disobedience. Sorry, I'm getting stuffy down here. Our disobedience caused him to spurn his temple for a time. So they had the sacrifices still going on until 70 AD. You can see it all through the book of Acts. We went through the book of Acts together. So go to my um, YouTube channel and look at that. So he didn't take away the sacrificial laws. He's coming back and Ezekiel 45 shows him doing them. We simply lost the right to do them right now because of our disobedience. That's in the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, Lamentations, Hosea. What did Thomas write that I missed? Oh, yay. Yes, Thomas, that's beautiful. Your ZZ. I would love to see pictures of your ZZ. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Do you believe Ruth was an Israelite or Moabite? Well, she became an Israelite. She was grafted in. She was a blood Moabite. But once you come to God, there's no Moabite gate going into the New Jerusalem. So she was grafted in. Um, she was a Moabite. Exactly. Um, you guys are on this. Good job. What is the Talmud? The Talmud was the, um, so after the Babylonian exile of the Jews, the Jews went to Babylon for 70 years. They began to codify and write down and put together all these extra oral laws to try to fence in the actual Torah of God. So then after Yeshua was here, they really codified it and put it all together in the book called the, like, um, you know, the Mishnah and all these things. And they, they have all these rules in this book that are extra that you're supposed to follow. Like you have to tie your shoe a certain way and say a blessing. You have to, um, wash your hands before you eat. You have to only walk so, so far on the Sabbath. They're all extra rules. They fenced in the law of God and it was very simple. We're not supposed to add to or take away from the law of God. Okay. Okay. No problem. Blessing Zedekiah. Blessing Stanley. Do you know of a translation that doesn't call Yeshua Jesus? Um, so the scriptures Bible um, uses the word Yeshua, the scriptures, and it's pretty good. I mean, it's pretty accurate. Um, shalom, shalom, everyone. Okay, Brennick has to the current apocryphal books. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you, Melissa and Daniel, for your help. Oh, I love you, Miss Lee. You're amazing. I said, um, so Austin, it really, it, ooh, yeah, it really depends on the terms of the divorce and what was going on, because if somebody divorces over just if if her ex husband was an adulterer, the Bible does show that she would be free and released. Um, but if it was just for irreconcilable differences, which comes from pride, then 
then she might not be free. So that's something to carefully consider with prayer so you don't make a, you know, do a transgression. Um, oh, awesome, Dale. I'm glad you like it. Um, why do you believe that Saturday's the Sabbath, according to this Roman system we are currently in? When did... So the Bible in the book of Genesis set, a, set up the system of seven days, not based on a conjunction of a new moon or the full moon or anything, because you couldn't you couldn't tell that. We're, we know we go off the visible sighting of the new moon. In fact, Psalm 80, 81 actually is mistranslated. It doesn't say at the time of your full moon. It says at the time of the covered moon. And so we go off a seven-day cycle, which is not Gregorian, which is not influenced by man. That's established by Yahweh himself in the book of Genesis. The seventh day is the Sabbath. He says, Yom Rishon, Yom Sheni, Yom Shelashi, Yom Rivi, Yom Chamashi, Yom Shishi, Yom Shabbat. So we understand there are seven days in a week, the seventh day of every cycle. It's not, you don't have sometimes six days in a week. You don't have sometimes five days in a week because of the stupid solar lunar calendar thing. It's wrong. And so it's not biblical. And in ancient um there's always a seventh day cycle every time. We don't miss a Sabbath some weeks. That's just, that's not the nature of God. And it's just not biblical. Um, ancient history, like Josephus' records and other people always show how Yeshua kept the Sabbath. He kept the Sabbath. And every seven days in the book of Acts talks about it. How they always met on the Sabbath every week, not like every other week sometimes, like according to this made up lunar calendar. So God, we are told in the book of Zechariah, also we know Yeshua returns at the sliver of the new moon. Um, that's how we know when our months are. If we, and that's just ancient knowledge, like, you know, Karaite Jews who reject the Talmud and they just are solo scriptura. They, they show us that, that yeah, we, we had to go by the visible sighting of the new moon. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. And guys, I'm going to go here soon. Um, oh, I'm sure you helped a lot, Danielle. Yes, we should follow Yahweh's laws, not man's. Um, um, Thing. Yeah, awesome. Saying, I heard Yahweh in my ear say, do not touch it. That's not of me. And then when you find the history of it, that was the Spanish king said, hey, somebody go find the book of Enoch and I'll give you lots of money. And somebody goes, and find just at that time in history, never before had they found it. And they went to Ethiopia lots of times. And then it's so contradictory to, um, yeah, it's so contradictory to the Torah. Thanks, James. Good job. Um, is this, there's separation? So there's not really, so the Ten Commandments are chapter headings. And both of those chapter headings fall in two categories, how to love God and how to love your neighbor. One of the things that God wanted us to do was worship him with these offerings. And the word sacrifice really is just in, indicating a, a butchering. So y'all eat meat, right? And this is just talking about the meat we go and eat with God in his presence. So we'll, we'll be doing it again. That's why you don't do Passover in your own homes. We're told in Deuteronomy 16, don't you dare eat Passover in your homes. Like people, I keep seeing these pushback, but it's like, there's a simple, like God keeps telling me there's a spirit of stupor on people. And I'm like, oh Lord, just please help. Like the Bible says, like now that we have the, where, where we had the place where the God had put his name, we got punished and cast out of the land of Israel. It says, don't you dare, Deuteronomy 16, I'm not making this up. Don't you dare eat the Passover. It's a sacrifice in your gates. Nobody's doing any other sacrifices in their gates. We're waiting for the temple. So why are they fighting so hard for that? Because they think it's a feast. So that shows their arrogant, wicked heart because they're not thinking about God. They're thinking about themselves. Um, shalom, shalom, shalom. Um, is it possible to locate the area where the Garden of Eden was? Some say Shechem, yes. Yeah, honestly, I don't know. Some people say just like in the Mesopotamia region there, some over in Babylon area. No, wouldn't that be neat to know? The book of Yahweh says Yahusha. It actually doesn't. So Yahusha is a man, is a made up. And if you look at the Greek Septuagint, it proves that, that it's Yeshua. So the Greek Septuagint is an ancient writing of the Old Testament. And they say, the word they use there is pronounced Yesu, and, and it's Ye. They have a sound for Ah. They don't use the letter for Ah. They use the Ye. And so it's, and we know they didn't have an SH, and so it's Yeshua. Um, and so Yahusha is doesn't work and it was based on some guy in who wrote the Sefer scriptures who got confused because he didn't know Hebrew and he's like well it's Yehuda he messed up and he misunderstood he extrapolated out to something that doesn't work so Yahusha is not a word in anything in Hebrew it's just like um, Yahua is not a word it can't physically grammatically be that so there's a confusion I don't argue with people though like you say whatever you want to say but I can just tell you grammatically that doesn't work and it's not biblical looking at the Greek Septuagint proves that his name was actually Yeshua um um there you go. We have to, you got it, Willie. Um, so God says you can get to safety. He doesn't say you can leave for abuse. He just doesn't. Um, and many people, I, as a counselor, have counseled, counseled many people who felt they were mentally abused when 
that was just their own pride coming in the way. And so there really does have to be prayer with this. So I'm just going to encourage you guys to do a fast and a pray together and seek the Father with all your heart so he would reveal. Because, I mean, without me knowing the whole situation, I don't want to pass a judgment on hearsay. But really seek Yahweh on it before you enter into something, okay? Um, I'm thinking of doing Sabbath. How do I? So, Kelsey, we just honor the Sabbath. We don't work. We don't exchange money. We we um, ha we delight in the Sabbath, Isaiah 58. We prepare our food on day six. Um, we get together, have a holy convocation as we're commanded in the book of Exodus, and we just love Yahweh. We go on bike rides, walks. We don't do the extra Judaism laws. We don't make it burdensome, but we just rest in the Lord, and you really find delight in that. Um, and uh, <laughs> Mark, oh my gosh, oh yeah, people, people, people. It doesn't say a woman's not supposed to teach. By the way, if you read that in the Greek, one trans possible translation could be that a woman's not allowed to teach, except or a woman's not allowed to teach in synagogue, except to teach. Like it literally can read that in one way. Um, a woman is not allowed to speak except to teach because see, women were separated from men and so they didn't want them yelling over. And it literally could read, I read it the other day in the Greek, it said a woman is not permitted to teach ex or, uh, to speak except to teach. But it literally says or except to teach, she's not to teach her husband. So when you read it in the way it's written, it literally says a woman's not to teach her husband. It doesn't say a woman's not to teach a man. People love to twist scripture for whatever they want. Um, So Leah, we must remember, we must remember, we we keep the first day, we keep the unleavened bread, the things we're commanded to do in our, our gates. We remember the Passover. We, we get together. We lament that we don't have it. Zephaniah 3.18 says, those who mourn for the feast. We pray. We read the story. Um, but we, there's nothing really we can do. We can't. If the dinner you have is not Passover dinner. It's like you can't do the sacrifice in your own gates or your own homes. Um, but we remember it. Um, breaking bread is a good thing to do on that day, what they call, quote, communion, but it's just breaking the bread and drinking the wine because you remember what Yeshua did. Um, and then we do keep the festival of unleavened bread, remove the leaven. We have a holy convocation and the Sabbath on the first day and the last day of that festival. So I hope that helps. Um, oh, I might have... I don't know what your question was, Dorothy. I'm sorry, you might have to message me privately. Yes, D, they're going to try to do that, sweetie. Exactly, Angela. There's no Torah commandment that says a woman can't teach. I just read you from the book of Micah where it says in chapter 6 that, like, he sent them Miriam and then hold of the prophetess and Philip's daughters. And Joel 2 says your men and women will prophesy. And and, and um, Deborah was a leader of Israel. Like, um, there you go, Jesse. Good, good job. How do we celebrate Passover somewhere? We can't really celebrate Pass Passover right now, Passos, in our homes because we're told in Deuteronomy 16 not to do that. So what we do is we remember it. We get together and we just wait and we kind of read the story. And usually that's what we've done in years past. Um, just prepare our hearts and mourn and pray out, cry out for the restoration of everything. Um, Shavu, Shavu to beloved Mishpika, Shavu to. Yes, um, but we will commemorate Passover. Just don't eat the meal. So we, yeah, we remember Passover, but we can't like, okay, if we, for example, I'm going to tell you, if you're eating lamb, that's not the Passover lamb. Like a Passover is, we're told, remember in Exodus 12, um, yeah, 12, or is it 20, that it's the sacrifice, it's Exodus 12. But we don't sacrifice, we can't sacrifice, and we're told in Deuteronomy 16, we can't sacrifice it. So we get together, I mean, you're still going to eat, you need something. We just we just make sure not to do lambs, so no people get confused, because we're like this isn't the Passover sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. We can't do it until we get to the land of Israel, um, and so we mourn, cry out for Yahweh to come back and restore us. Okay. Um, right. So we don't do a Passover meal because you can't really do the Passover meal. You could only eat that in your gates. The book of Matthew, remember, is mistranslated. There's 2,000 manuscripts of the book of Matthew. When you want to read the timeline of the Passover story, go to the book of John. It shows you Jesus died at the time of Passover. They did not eat the Passover in the upper room, but that came through translational errors of people who did not understand the law of God because the people who translated the book of Matthew were antinomians. That means against the law. They were in the Greek mindset, didn't understand the Hebrew mindset, and so then they they got that messed up, let me tell you. Um, yep, we can you can heat up food, Brenna. You can do you can take walks, you can go on drives, you can have so much beautiful stuff. Um exactly. 
Yeah, and so exactly. So Cassandra, so if we did a lamb, then our minds are thinking, I'm eating Passover, but that's not true. We lost the right to eat at the Passover because of our sin, and we need to be crying out for that restoration. Well, it, Tammy, it says in the Bible not to make food. It says not to cook on Sabbath. Like there's a specific command in Exodus that says you shall not, like, you shall bake what you shall bake and cook what you will cook on day six. Um, but if, it doesn't say not to go on walks. Or, I mean, you'd have to walk to synagogue. You'd have to travel. You'd have to do things to get together for the Holy Convocation. Um, and so this is where we don't want to become um, rigid Judaizers with the Torah. We want to embrace it in its truth. And yeah, work, cooking is a lot of work. But riding a bike isn't a lot of work. Like you kind of get your bike out and you just kind of go on a jaunt, you know. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, we would not do sports on Sabbath, um, Nicole. We don't do that. Um, so, so Tammy, um, it, well, I think it's more, I think Paul's messed up there. I think more of it is Judaism, I got to be honest. Um, and I think it more is the place, like in Second Timothy, it, it seems more to indicate that it could say, a woman is not to speak except to teach. <laughs> like that's what it seems more to say in the Greek there. Um, but I want to be careful what I'm saying there because it does say a woman cannot speak except to teach. And if you think about the two different groups, if a woman stands up and has a teaching, then she's allowed. Um, but you just, if you've had a husband, you just know they're pretty unteachable. Like we're not the head of the home. And I think that's what Paul was saying. Either way, we don't follow Paul. We follow Yeshua. We follow the Torah. The Torah does not permit a, does not prohibit a woman from teaching. And that's just the fact. And Paul had a few things that he was messed up on. He was talking about head coverings. And he said, yeah, you know, we just know no other way. But Paul wasn't God. And Paul, like, just like Peter was messed up about separating from the Gentiles, Paul had his own things where he still had some confusion on. Remember the disciples marveled at Yeshua? See, just because they were the disciples didn't mean they were perfect. He mar they marveled that he talked to a woman. Um, no, you don't have to get rid of flour, Jessica. Nope, just your yeast, your baking powder, the things that contain the baking powder, like crackers and breads and stuff like that. Um... Bless you, bless you, Randy. Would you still put half shekel in for atonement during the feast? Well, see, that's the thing. We can't really do some of those things outside of the temple. Does that make sense? Um, but when we go to the temple again, when we have that third temple, we'll do all those things. Yeah, self-rising flour you need to get rid of. Good job, Angela, we're catching that. Baking powder, yeast, lemon agents, you got it. So like um, calcium carbonate. Um, so baking soda on itself isn't leaven, but when you put it with an acid, boom, it becomes leaven. So um, that's your, you, you do that at your discretion. Um, the same thing with cream of tartar. Oh my gosh, I'm so tired. Um, yeah, all purpose flour is okay. You go ahead and get some rest. Thanks, for, thanks James. Um, yep, yod hey bav hey. Easter is the 31st, which is a pagan holiday, so we're supposed to prepare for Passover. Okay. So we, so we won't have, Passover day won't be until April, approximately April 22nd, okay? So we'll keep you posted, Josh, if you follow our line. Um, we're supposed to have the new moon sighted around between April 8th and April 10th. Interesting, right around the time of the solar eclipse, right? Not interesting, it's prophetic. And so then we'll we'll know when we have all that. Um, yeah, okay. You guys are awesome. How do you get a chance to interview? Well, you message me. I have hundreds of messages a day, dear sir. So feel free to contact me. Um, I'm not always the quickest to get back to them because I have so many. <laughs> so then after I check all of Instagram, then I got to give myself a little break and get some work done. And then I check all of Facebook and then I got to do some work. And then sometimes I remember to check YouTube. Oh my goodness. But then I get to it. So feel free to message me. Um, I was like, I was on a, I was a guest on a, pod, a YouTube channel the other day. I'm waiting for him to get that all edited. So he's a wonderful really a kind man. Um, oh, thanks, Seng, um, for putting that up there. Um, so, Han Hanley, I have a farm. I'm a farmer. I do not milk my cows on Sabbath. I calf share so that I don't have to milk on Sabbath. I have dual-purpose cows, so I don't have a jersey that was horribly bred by humans to make so much milk that was never natural in the wild. I think it's so cruel. I think it's so cruel what they've done to these jerseys. Um, it's not natural. It's not normal. Those jerseys never naturally did that. And so I make sure I have things that are more natural, more ancient varieties and species of animals. Um, I have to feed my chickens. I let them out. I open the coop, but I make sure like everything's pretty much ready the night before and the day before the waters. I feel right before I go to bed I make sure everything's done. Um, but I take, you know, I have to feed hay to my cows. We're in Wyoming, so I have to feed hay. I can't, if I put it in the feeder the night before, they're just going to eat it. So I have to throw them a bale of hay, um, in the morning and the night, but I keep my chores to a minimum. Does that make sense? 
<laughs> Lee. I was told to shut my face hole on that one because my husband can't find the hamper either. And he was like a star basketball athlete who could dunk the ball. He was number one in the state of Colorado for his division. And he cannot hit that hamper. So Lord told me to get off his back <laughs> 20 some years ago. Um, so Shanika, we don't, we, I have always been told by God to destroy it, like just to destroy it and start over. So my sourdough starter and everything I throw out and I start over. It's good. It's good to do. Um, yeah. Okay. So right now on my counter upstairs, I have like a little box now on the counter and like the entryway. It's our festival of leavened bread box. And we're like, you got, we got to be eating our way through that. <laughs> okay, guys, I am going to get off. I think that, um, what do you think about women only being wearing a skirt? Um, so it doesn't say in scripture. In fact, so in 2002, when I first started obeying Torah, everybody was saying I had to cover my head and wear a skirt. Now, I'm an active woman. I do construction with my husband. I build houses. I physically lay the rock. I physically frame the walls. It's he and I, like literally, I do every phase of it. I'm on the ladder, um, setting trusses. I pour the concrete. I'm a hard worker. Do you want me in a dress? And so I was, I, when I first came to Torah, I was like crying one day because I played with my son at the playground and now I had the stupid dress on and I couldn't even do the flips and the stuff on the monkey bars with them. And I said, okay, Lord, if this is my life. And he said, did I tell you to wear a skirt? And I said, no. I got my, because he talks to me in my ear. And I said, I sat up and I said, well, no. He said, what did I tell you? I said, you told me not to wear men's clothing. He said, Mel, that's talking about cross-dressing. Whose pants are you wearing? Are they women's or men's? I said, women's. He said, I didn't tell you to wear a dress. He goes, men in the old days wore robes. Like, right, everybody wore dresses in the same garb. He goes, you're not supposed to cross-dress. And he goes, I want you to be humble and modest, but you don't have to wear a dress. So at that point, I felt free. <laughs> I was so happy. And I was literally submitting to him in the moment, just being like, oh, I'm so sad. I'll never have a life again. I don't know how I'm going to do this in dresses. And he said, I didn't tell you to wear a dress. I told you not to dress like a man. I was like, oh, praise God. <laughs> um, well, we were told to do all the Torah forever, Isaiah. He just knew that we would mess up, and that's why the restoration's coming, right? So he has a prophesied time of forgiveness. Will the Father let us know it's time to leave? For oh, yeah, he's going to, there's going to be no denying, guys. We're going to be persecuted like they were, like Egypt started persecuting them. Don't turn and grumble against Moses leading you out. Some of you already been angry at me. You'll like reach out. I'm kind of angry at you because you said this, but I know it was the truth of God. Yeah, don't kill the messenger, people. We're just here to help you. You got a lot. There's teachers around the world. I believe there's 144,000 teachers that are teaching strong right now. Um, we're trying to help you. That's what the fathers told me with some of these things. Um, we're just the messenger. Just the messenger. Just the messenger. We're just trying to help you. I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> um, and so you're going to be right now convicted a lot. You're going to be purified a lot. God is really going to be pressing on you. It's going to feel like a lot. You're going to feel defeated. You're going to feel overcome. Don't give up. You say, praise God, praise God, praise God, break me. Get me over my flesh. Have that heart. Okay. Okay. Kiddos, I'm going to have to go. Is there any pertinent question I really missed? Ahava, love. I'm getting belly aches from eating all this living. <laughs> Angela. Feed it to your chickens. Feed it to your chickens. You're so funny. Um, there's This is a beautiful community. Shanika, everybody feel free to join us Friday night on the Zoom. This is a beautiful community. I love these people so much. Um, we have so many wonderful sisters and brothers. Um, you got it, saying, um, open invite to come help us eat these cookies. I have a few boxes of organic cookies also if anybody needs any. Um, you don't have to, like even Paul explains, Tammy, that the head covering is a, he says, we just know no other way. Um, our hair is our covering, but if you feel to cover, if you feel to wear a dress, please do it. You live your life to Yahweh. What we don't do is, no, what I do know is wrong. Like Yahweh told me it's sinful for women to wear makeup because I asked him, Lord, is that just for me or everybody? He said, that's for everybody. He said, but you don't, you know, if somebody wants to, and, and dressing immodest is sinful for everybody, but he said like, like whether you wear a hair, head covering or not, that's between you and him. There's no commandment in Torah that says to do it. But it's not wrong if you want to do it, right? I will be feeding what is left of the chicken. Seriously. <laughs> good night, all good night. So. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes, I should send you a cookie gift. Um, of all times, praise Yahweh. I mean, my husband's going through some stuff. 
Um, but he did finally take my advice to, you know I'm a health nut. Like I work out two to three hours a day at the minimum, very into fitness, lifting weights and running and making sure I take care of the temple of God. I eat healthy, I try not to eat any sugar or very minimal sugar. So my husband decided this week to make the switch, which I'm thankful. He's been listening. I've been telling him for 20 some years, like, hey, we should, you know, well, and specifically in the last 10 years, as we get older, I'm almost 50, he's 51. So I'm 48 and a half, he's 51, yeah. He decides to stop eating sugar. <laughs> so now we have all these cookies. And I'm like, well, praise Yahweh. I'd rather him stop eating sugar. <laughs> um, okay, cookie grams. There you go. I'll give you a cookie gram. Why is makeup a sin? Because, Tammy, it's about vanity. What the Father told me is it's fake and it's vanity. And many people understand that so everything is either of God or Satan. And Satan is the one who wants us women to be vain and try to change ourselves into something we're not for alluring of men. Our humility and righteousness, we're to be humble and righteous. That's what we're speaking, not to be vain and focus on us. And you're right, Jesse, it's a form of witchcraft. It draws us attention to ourselves. It's the Jezebel spirit. Jezebel painted her eyes. And Yahweh told me that in 2004. I hardly ever wore makeup, but I used to wear just a little bit of eyeliner, mascara, and lipstick. But most days I didn't wear anything. And so when the Father convicted me of that, I started feeling him pull away because I wasn't giving in, I wasn't obeying. And finally, I just sat there and I said, okay, Lord, I'm ready to submit to you. Please teach me. And he did and he, I obeyed. So I, and then I felt him come right back to me and you can just see it's not of him. God would never have had women paint their eyes, color their hair, be vain. God wants us to be humble and pure. And that's what we do. So we wear, you know, he blesses us with our long, our hair of our covering. If one time, Years ago when my husband was going through a major cleansing, my hair broke off and came up to here. And I was like, what happened? And it was just my covering was getting shorter. He had to go through some things. And so God speaks to us and helps us. And But he does want, he you know, he has the women grow out our hairs or covering. He blesses us with that. He wants us to take care of our bodies. If you are out of shape and overweight, I'll, I'll help you. Um, Miss Laura, are you still on? She's, how's she doing? Um... Well, the chapstick and lip balm aren't colored. They're not like, that's just, see, there's therapy and there's nothing that alters for your look from chapstick or lip balm. Um, there you go, Morgan. Um, I'm sorry, Konji, but Konji, what you have to remember is that you're beautiful, how God made you. He didn't mess up. And what God told me, like years, like I haven't worn makeup since 2005, 2000, anyway, in that time frame, 2004. And it was, um, he said, be real. Let him see you. Um, I, I don't, Tammy. I don't do anything. Yahweh told me to be humble. And he goes, get your eyes up yourself. He goes, when you think of dressing yourself in the morning, think of dressing yourself with me and representing me. So I think of him covering me. Make sure when I bend over, my shirts are high. Notice how you'll always see my shirts are high. Every once in a while, one of my jammy shirts I'll have on, I'll start doing a reel and I'll forgot that it was like a V-neck. And you'll see me in the video sometimes, like catch myself. I'm like, make sure I don't bend over right now. Um, because I didn't even think about it. I just like started real. I had an idea. I'm like, oh, okay, yes, Lord, let's go get that. And I'm like, oh, you know, it was my jammy shirt um, or something like that. If, you know, make sure your jeans aren't form fitting. We don't wear the skinny jeans. Leggings, guys, come on. Like that's like painted on skin. That's ridiculous. We don't like, right? And so when I go to the gym, my shorts are the basketball shorts that are loose. I don't wear the leotards. My tank tops are loose and over me. Um, I I, Yahweh has really told me we have to be humble. Um, so any makeup, yeah. So Eos Mint, the chapstick is fine. But the if it if we're fake and we're like so worried about our vanity, then we're forgetting that the, our eyes are supposed to be on Yeshua, and all we're supposed to do is represent Him. I'm not supposed to make myself look good in this world. I'm supposed to glorify my God. I'm not supposed to take money. I'm not supposed to build my own kingdom. I'm not supposed to think, oh, I want everybody like me and think I'm awesome and smart and wonderful. I'm supposed to be like, Yahweh, how do I get your people free from their sin? And how can I work for your kingdom to glorify your name? I, yeah, so Shanika, if the, if the, if the leggings are 100% cotton, I have a few pairs of leggings that I'll wear under dresses sometimes, but... I'm sorry, but when that booty's just hanging out there, that's horrible. That's horrible. And like, I don't even wear them with just long shirts because um, I'm very fit and in shape. So it's not like I have to be worried, worried about fat rolls, but I think it's it, like 
it could got, cause guys to lust. And I don't think I'm pretty or anything, but I'm like, still guys look at stuff like that. And it's, I don't want to be a stumbling block to them. I don't want to dishonor my husband. Uh, you know what I mean? I just want to cover. Um, you're right, Carissa. That's a good way to put it. You won't scare people. That's what Yahweh wants us to be, just humble. And he, he lets it. We, we have been taught and indoctrinated in our society that we're not good enough without makeup or these fake things. When you let go of it, you do feel insecure because that we've been taught these lies. But then all of a sudden you realize I'm beautiful because God loves me. I'm beautiful because the spirit in my heart. I'm beautiful not because of what I look like. I'm only beautiful when I glorify my God. You know what I mean? I don't do any nails. We don't do any nails. Yahweh told me not to. He gave us dreams back in what, 2004, 2000, something about that, not to do the nails. Um, just, I'm not, we're not supposed to be vain and focused on all that stuff. Um, um, yep, yeah, ZZs, sees I wear them every day. Um, usually just, you can get safety pins for those, Jessica, to clip them on. Um, yep, yeah, Willie, um, perfect. Okay, guys, I love you all so very much. I am going to go to bed. <laughs> Thank you all for your prayers. Thank you all for your love. Please know that I love you. Please, please know that on any of my posts, I want you all sharing. On here, I want you all sharing. I want you sharing. This is not about me. We are brothers and sisters together. I might be the mama because I'm older. It doesn't mean I'm better. Let's help each other, love each other. Um, Thank <laughs> Well, you do what, Jessica, you just, you make yourself different pairs. You can make as many as you want. I love you all so very much. Yahweh bless you. Good night. I'm going to go curl up in bed. I'm so thankful for you all. Exactly. So, Tammy, you're going to just shine because of the light of God in you. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I know the difference, Tammy, because I used to, like, have the, the curled hair. Because my hair is naturally kind of curly. During the day, If I, once I comb it, then the way, then the curls all go out and just goes, like, weird, wavy. I've never, I don't comb my hair, or I haven't colored my hair for over 20 years. So you're starting to see the grays. And there are days I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm so ugly. And I'm like, stop it. Stop it. I am made in the image of God, and he did not mess up how he made me. And I'm not here to be adored by how I look. I'm here to serve my God. I am here to serve my God. I am here to serve Yahweh. It does not matter what I look like, right? That's what we need. Um, I love you all so very much. If you have questions, please message me. Um, again, it may take a minute, and sometimes I forget to check the spam folder, but I'll get it. Um, oh, look at Cassandra. She's awesome. You guys are awesome. Um, don't forget, Friday night Zoom, Sunday morning teaching on Facebook Live. Sunday, I'm sorry, Saturday morning. What in the world? My, I'm so tired. Friday night Zoom, Saturday morning, 10 a.m. So Saturday, Friday night, 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time Zoom. I'll give you the link if you message me. Saturday morning, 10 a.m. live. Then Sunday night, 7 p.m. Zoom for Hebrew. Mm, mm. Ooh, I might have to push it back. I just realized I have a photo session. I'll try to hurry. Um, and then, yes. And then we'll set up next week's schedule. I love you all. You're amazing. Look at you guys. I'll go. Lila Tov, Lila Tov, Lila Tov. Okay. I love you all. If you have questions, we'll talk. See you Friday night. If I go live tomorrow, I'll let you all know. Well, I'll let some, I just kind of message who's right there on the messenger, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. I'm catching up on stuff. <laughs> love you guys. Good night.